one. My first time camping with friends by the angry chicken lady. You can call me Alice. I'm currently 25 and live in Essex, England. I was 19 when, in April 2012, my male best friend invited me to go camping with him, along with a workmate that he fancied and some of her friends. I knew the main reason for him inviting me was because I could drive, but he was also my close friend and I got along well with his friends that I'd met, so I said I was game. Even when I discovered my ex and his new girlfriend would be there, I was still excited as they were both genuinely nice people and there were no negative feelings. When the time came, we loaded up in my tiny old Nova and my ex's car and we set off to the new forest. Our drive was long. We even had a good laugh after we turned up at the wrong campsite and we finally rolled into the right place. We stayed Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night to drive home on Monday. Friday and Saturday went by undramatically, and we had great fun exploring the area and having barbecues, etc. We decided not to set up in the open field area with loads of tents and noise, opting instead for a clearing edged by trees on three sides, just down this tree-lined stony lane, maybe 800 yards off the main field. There were two other camps down there, spaced far apart from each other, probably other people after some peace and quiet like we were. The rest of my group really ballsed up at setting up the tent and air beds, so they ended up freezing night after night, lying only a few millimeters away from liquid mud, but that's camping in England during the spring for you. As for me, I slept in my car each night, despite my achy back. On Sunday morning, I groggily creaked out of my car, grabbing my wash bag and toiletries, and started to totter off to the loos, which are at the top of the treeless slope. Suddenly, a short, chubby man comes waddling down the lane. He sees me and starts to walk around my car. He looks absolutely livid. I made brief eye contact with him, and I saw the rage in his eyes. I assumed he's something to do with one of the other camps behind us. It's too early for that kind of stuff, so I looked away and continued on. Then I hear him shout, but I can't hear him due to my tinnitus. He wasn't super close just yet, so he shouts again, this time getting my attention, and he speeds up toward me. You can all get out right now before I call the police. You're not welcome here. I stop and blink. What's he on about? He continues shouting, gaining attention from all the camps now. He starts raving on about me driving donuts around the mini roundabout near the reception for speeding up and down the road that runs down the camping fields, then lists more dangerous driving offenses. Considering it was 7 a.m. and I literally just woke up, I was speechless. I tried to maintain composure and politeness despite his intimidating approach and explained that it could not have been me, but he insists that it had to only have been this car, saying that there's no other cars here like it. I turn defiantly and firmly shout to him, fine, touch the bonnet. We both touch the hood of the car at the same time, and of course it was gratifyingly cool to the touch. See, I said, if I'd been speeding around like you claim, the engine would be hot and the metal bonnet would be heated, it wasn't me. His lip curled as he stared at the bonnet for nearly a minute, his hand still resting there as if trying to find some source of heat. In his eyes, I could see him realizing that I was correct. With the flounce and a mumbled word warning me about if he catches me again, he stormed off back up the lane. No one knew how to react to him, and the whole clearing had an atmosphere for a while. No one even recognized him as part of the staff, and he didn't wear a uniform. That was just the start of a very awful trip. On the final day there, we shook off the incident, and soon the entire campground had a particularly cheery atmosphere as the evening was nice. The smells of barbecues all over and ale hung everywhere. At about 1 a.m., the others retired to their tent, and I laid back in the front passenger seat for another achy rest. 
This time I left the window half rolled up while I wound down for the night and enjoyed the bliss of nature. It was pretty dark in our clearing. I started to drift off, enjoying the cool breeze rolling through thanks to the window. Suddenly, a long, terrible scream fills the air and everything seems to turn to ice in an instant. I freeze in my sleeping bag, shocked and waiting for something else to happen. Then I hear a wailing sound, terrible, pitiful, shrieking twice more before stopping. I shiver in my seat, paralyzed. Gradually, I very slowly extend my hand and roll my window up, confirming that all the doors are locked. I sat still for a very long time, twitching when I saw movement rustling amongst the trees on the far side of the clearing. My eyes darted around, waiting to see some lunatic come running out of God knows where. Silence fell over the camp, the atmosphere tense and heavy. Somehow, I managed to fall asleep. It may not have even been that long afterwards. I had no clock for reference and only realized I fell asleep when I woke up again. I checked my phone when I was awake and saw that it was a quarter past four in the morning. I peered forward to see what had awoken me. There was a helicopter flying over the woods, casting a beam of light here and there. A police car was parked not too far from us, and when I cracked my window open, I could hear the sounds of more vehicles in the distance. Something was going on. I decided to stay in my car, not sure what to do. We texted amongst each other. I explained what was going on that I could see, and we all settled on packing up early. Yet leaving took ages. When we finally emerged from the stony lane, we found the site to be crawling with more police, and no one was allowed to leave until they had answered several questions. All they told us was that someone had perished, and they needed any information available. I told them about the screams, and the rest had nothing to add, having slept through it. Eventually, we were allowed to leave. We decided to drive straight home, the atmosphere quiet and somber. This wasn't aided by me accidentally taking the wrong direction on the M25 and lengthening the already miserable journey. We later found out what happened. A large family had gone away for a big birthday weekend and thrown a barbecue at their camp out. They were in the same camping area as us. When a little girl got sleepy, her family tucked her up in their tent and went back to their barbecue. Her mother got concerned that the daughter would get cold, so she put the used barbecue in the tent to keep her warm. When they checked in on her a few hours later, she had asphyxiated and sadly passed away. The screams we had heard that night were from her mother just discovering the lifeless body of her little girl. And to this day, it chills my blood when I think about it. Sometimes it comes unbidden to my mind, the terrible sound of raw, painful emotion and unimaginable horror. The New Forest is a wonderful and magical place to visit, and this experience didn't spoil it for me. But whenever I'm reminded of the New Forest, my mind always wanders to that little girl and her family. Two, The Friendly Campers by Zach. It was about a year ago. Me and my friends, a bunch of college students, had an affinity for road trips. It's just another form of escapism for us. As college goes, our bank accounts stopped accommodating trips around the East Coast, so we took up camping instead. My best friend owns this land a few hours east of Scranton, Pennsylvania. We all elected to take this big camping trip by the end of the summer, and we spent a while preparing. When the time came, we divided ourselves into two cars, split tents, food, drinks, and everything else among us. As we came close to the destination, our GPS went out, so we relied on physical maps we brought with us. After an hour, we arrived at the campsite at just about dusk. We unloaded all of our stuff, set up our tents, and built a nice bonfire, 
We delegated bonfire duty to one person, and by God, he kept it lit the whole day. The first night was fun. I got over the creepy ambience of being in the middle of nowhere after five or six beers. We exchanged stories, pranked each other, and soon went to bed. On the second day, a group of my friends decided they were going to make the two hour drive to some hick town in order to get more firewood and snacks. I was in the group that stayed behind. According to them, they ended up getting lost in the morning fog and found themselves at the local store sometime after sunrise. After purchasing their stuff, they encountered a ragged old man in the parking lot, your archetypal hillbilly, as hick as you can get on the eastern seaboard. He asks for a cigarette, they oblige, and then begins to berate them with questions. Stuff like, what's your name? Where are you from? What are you doing here? To that latter question, he was very interested. He asks where we're camping, and if he could stop by. They think he's joking and laugh, but he insists. He says he'll hang out with us and doesn't drop the subject even as they are entering their car. By then, they're all too high to notice the guy hopping into his beaten up pickup truck. They don't find out they're being followed until they leave the paved roads and see him following them onto the dirt trails leading back to the campsite. Again, I attribute this to them being high, but they still kept going back to the campsite. They said that they had no room to turn around and nowhere to go, but hey, Leading this guy back was not a good idea. The whole time, I'm just sitting at the fire smoking and have no idea it's happening because of the absence of cell service in the area. When I see them rushing back hours late, I say, oh, come on, where are the snacks at? Where's breakfast? They make a jumbled recounting of this guy that followed them miles back. At first, I think they're just pranking but the fear plastered onto their faces was obvious. They say he parked the car about 40 feet behind theirs and watched them get out. I get the rest of us together and we all decide to confront this guy. So it turns out he was coming first. We're walking the 20 minute walk to the cars and as we see this dirty old man in the clearing, we see that he's holding a hunting rifle. We weren't going to try and make a break for it or see what the guy wanted. So we decided to loop back around to the camp and then try to make a wide arc to avoid him. So we get back to the camp and half the time it took us to walk there and began frantically packing our essentials in a high stupor. As we're about to turn around and go, my friend points out that the bonfire is giving off a lot of smoke on account of all the leaves we used for kindling. So it's assumed that the guy can figure out exactly where we were we stop our packing process immediately and dip into the trees, running with reckless abandon to cover as much ground as possible. As we're reaching the car, we then hear gunshots in the direction of the camp. We get into our car and floor it out of there. After a two hour drive back into town, we reach a police station. We submit our report, even though we were clearly under the influence. They hold us at the station and send a car out to investigate. We're sitting around, freaking out. Moreover, the consequences of going to the cops high rather than being scared of the maniac. It's late in the afternoon before the car returns and tells us what they found. The tents were shredded up and had shell casing and bullet holes in them. So, no, he wasn't just hunting out there and we had gotten it all wrong. Aside from the food wrappers, they said barely anything else was left behind. From our own accounting, the guy took our weed, our keg of beer, but also my friend's wallet. We tell the police the latter, and he says they'll continue to search around, but they didn't find any cars around. We ended up going home early. My friend had to cancel his debit card and get a new ID, and we all haven't heard of anything since. Of course, the knowledge is still haunting us that this psychopath knows who he is, and roughly where he lives. I'm sure nothing will come of it. Nothing has, and it's been a year. But I have no idea what this guy's intentions with us were. Why did he follow us all the way out there? Why did he shoot up our stuff? If we had remained, would we be filled with holes as well? We haven't been back to that camping site since, 
but we do plan on returning this summer. It's June, and we're going back in August, completely sober this time. We're going to see what came of this, if the case is even still open. Wish us luck. Three, Best Camping Trip by Matthias. The story starts with my cousin Mick calling my sister to ask if she would give him a ride to a campsite in Nagal, New Mexico. He asked her if she wanted to go with him and she said yes, but she asked if I could go as well. I was excited as this was going to be my first real camping trip. Mick's sons were coming as well. They were Nick and Barry. My sister has a trunk with a big bed, so me, Nick, and Barry sat in the back on the way over. When we arrived, we started putting up the tents. We had gotten there at about 5.32 p.m., and it gets dark here at about six, so by the time we had things set up and were gathering wood for the fire, it was dark. After a bit of talking, me and Nick decided to sit in the bed of the truck and talk there. Barry joined us a little while after. Meanwhile, Mick and my sister Shay go get more wood for the fire. When they were gone and the three of us were talking, we began to hear branches breaking or being moved in the woods. We thought it was my sister and Mick. Perhaps they had turned and they were coming in our direction now. But then we noticed the flashlight they had been using. The beam was coming on the opposite side of us, not from the direction of these noises. Being curious teens, the three of us thought we had to go and see what this was. We grabbed our own flashlights and went towards it. We looked around for a while, getting deeper and deeper into the woods by the second. I was so focused and intent on finding something that I didn't realize I had lost sight of Nick and Barry. I was going to yell for them, but just before I could, Nick screamed. His shoulder was bleeding. Due to the darkness, I didn't see it at first, but when it moved, there was a slight blur to it, and I saw it, some sort of pale animal. I shone my flashlight at it, and either it had no eyes, or its eyes were too dark to see, even with me shining my light on it. Its mouth was a triangular shape. When my light hit it, it cowered away. It opened its odd-looking mouth and screamed. A sound burst from it, something akin to a lion's roar, mixed with the sounds of a woman in pain. I grabbed Nick, pulling him back away from the creature and helping him stand up. He was latching at his shoulder, trying to cover his wound. As I continued to shine the creature in its eyes, it scurried away, its movements like some sort of glitched out insect. Back at camp, Barry was already there. Mick and Shay were coming out of the woods, wondering what the heck was going on as they had heard Nick scream. After seeing Nick's wound, we knew we had to get out of there. We packed up fast and got Nick to a hospital. Nick was fine after a lot of stitches. We tried to call the cops about it, but we were told they couldn't do anything, that we might have better luck with the game warden or the forest service. All in all, no matter what we did, nothing came of it. I guess all I can really say here is if you find yourself in the woods of Nagal, New Mexico at night, be careful and pray that you brought something to protect yourself with. Four, The Camping Creep and His Friends by Hannah. It was a random weekend in 2016. Two of my friends and I decided to go camping. We were all 16 to 17 years old at the time. I'm from a small town in Iowa, so there's really not much to do. Camping was our best option to have some fun without parents. We got to the campsite around three o'clock in the afternoon, and we were all set up by 3.30 or four-ish. A little background about this place. There's a pretty decent sized body of water and it's surrounded by 60 feet of rock around the entire thing. When you climb the rock, on the other side of the trail, there is a wooded area. It's actually quite beautiful, and a lot of young couples would go up to the top of the cliff and do their thing, because they thought it was romantic up there. 
It was a popular place to go, but this weekend there wasn't as many people as usual. We had made a fire and we were all sitting around it. To the left of us, there was a camper full of about five people. They looked like your typical potheads, but we didn't think anything of it. We had a lot of those kinds of people in this area and we were used to it. I would glance over occasionally because I would feel eyes on me from over there. Specifically, there was a man who seemed to be in his mid thirties and I caught him staring at me a few times and not in a very friendly way. I felt like he was undressing me with his eyes and it made me very uncomfortable. Keep in mind, I was a 16 year old young girl at the time and this guy was obviously way older than me. It was creepy and unsettling. My two friends were a couple. Lily and Will were their names. At one point, they decided to take a walk for some alone time. I was left at the tent by myself with those five weirdos to the left of me. I didn't really want to stay at the tent alone anymore, so I decided to grab my fishing pole and go try to catch some fish. I walked on down to the water. I was down there for about 10 minutes when I began to hear footsteps coming up from behind me. I turned around and there was that weird creepy guy who had been staring at me from earlier. I figured he probably wanted to go fishing or something, but then I noticed he didn't have a pole or any equipment. Up close, his eyes were even more crazy looking and I could tell that his intentions were not pure. I immediately became uneasy and I tried to think quickly but he randomly said to me, what's your name? I hesitated, not really sure if I should give this man my real name, but I didn't want to have him mad at me. So I told him, uh, Hannah. I tried to mind my own business and continue fishing, but he continued to try to talk to me. I would give him one word answers like, yeah, okay, cool. The conversation lasted about five minutes before he started getting really weird. He was asking me if I was a virgin, if I liked it rough and if I liked being choked. At that point, I knew I had to get out of there. So I said loud and clear, piss off. And I grabbed my fishing pole and my tackle box. I started walking back to the tent. Yet the guy continued to follow me up there. He did go back to his camper. He sat beside his friends and he stared. I set my stuff in the tent and looked over at the camper because I still felt watched and of course I was right, but now they were all staring at me. Two of them waved so I gave them all the finger, yet they only laughed at me and continued to stare. I walked in the same direction Lily and Will went. I didn't care if I interrupted their fun time. I was freaked out and they should not have left me alone. All those strangers, they gave off a bad vibe. I once again heard footsteps behind me after a couple of minutes of walking, and I knew exactly who it was. I knew that if I ran, he could probably catch up to me. I wasn't the fastest or the most in shape. I walked faster until I got to a point where there were two ways that I could go. I went right, hoping my friends did too. I started to speed up more, I was hoping that Lily and Will were at the romantic spot on the top of the cliff. On the way up there, there were a lot of holes and big rocks in the trail, and it was hard to keep a quick pace. I looked behind me, and he was only 10 feet away now. I called out to him, why the heck are you following me? He looked back and only smiled, revealing crooked, dirty teeth. He began to move quicker towards me, so I booked it. It was all uphill and my legs were killing me, but I could hear him gaining on me still. I was going as fast as I possibly could and I ended up tripping over a tree root that was coming out of the ground. I got up quickly and continued to run, but not quick enough. He grabbed me by my ponytail and pulled me backward, making me fall right on my back and hitting my head hard on the ground. I was dazed. I slowly tried to get up, but he was in front of me. Move, or there's going to be hell to pay, I told him. Honestly, I don't know why I did that. It was definitely not the best idea, but I wanted him to know that I wasn't scared to put up a fight. 
His smile faded, and he got on my face wide-eyed with an insane look, saying, Who do you think you're talking to, little girl? He grabbed me by my neck and put me up against a tree. I was so scared, but all I could do was fight back. I kneed him in the groin and pushed him over into what looked like a ditch of poison ivy. I hope it was. I continued to run. I soon saw Will standing up. I called his name. He looked over to me confused. I caught up to him and I was so out of breath and scared and as I was crying, he probably couldn't understand me very well, but I managed to tell them what had happened. Will decided to go confront the guy. He was pretty big, Will. He was about six foot two and was a farm boy, so I had confidence in him. Lily and I stayed up on the cliff for a while. We eventually went back down after I chilled out. When we arrived back at the tent, the creep and his creepy friends were gone. I asked Will what he did. Apparently, he had told them that he had some heavy firepower in the tent and he wasn't afraid to use it. He didn't actually have anything, but as he was outnumbered, he figured lying would be a good idea. And all that matters is that it worked. Throughout the remainder of the weekend, I couldn't get that experience out of my head and my throat was bruised. Five, the camp stalker by John. One sunny day, my friends and I thought it would be a great idea to go camping. I packed my clothes and iPad, and I was on my way to meet my friends at the campsite. When I got there, I noticed that one of them had brought their dog. I asked him why, and his reply was odd. I could not tell if he was trying to scare me or not because he himself also looked very frightened as he said it. Because something in the woods. I was sure that he was just telling a joke. I went ahead and got the tent set up with my friend, who I referred to as Jax. At around 11 p.m., we were still up, and we were telling stories around the campfire. Suddenly, his dog went absolutely crazy, barking aggressively in every direction. I told Jax to go check it out, and he said it's nothing nervously, and we resumed telling stories and making marshmallows. We went to sleep at about 12.34 p.m. I woke up to the sound of barking and growling. I told the dog to be quiet, but that didn't do anything. Frustrated, I raised out of my sleeping bag and unzipped the tent. I poked my head out and I looked around, trying to figure out what in the world he was barking at. It didn't take long. There was a large silhouette of someone standing next to the trees, and they were extremely tall, their head going past some of the branches on the trees. I freaking lost it and screamed, waking up Jax and telling him to run. We didn't pack up anything. Instead, we rode back to my house as fast as possible. I don't know who or what it was that was watching us sleeping in our tents, but I think this experience has ruined camping for me. Six, Man in the Campsite by Iglay. My older sister had a part-time job as a camp counselor in Lithuania, and she invited me to visit it at least once. I didn't really want to go, as it was a camp for vegetarians, but I did want to spend some time with my sister and a few other friends that would be attending. On the first two days, nothing really much happened. At night, I only heard a few branches snapping or leaves rustling, attributing the noise to squirrels or nighttime animals. On the third day, I got really bored and irritable. There was nothing to do, and I was getting hungry for actual food. I went back to the campsite. I was supposed to be back at the game area or helping the kitchen with lunch, but I was rebellious and decided to do my own thing. I lay down and started to read a book. Pretty soon, it became difficult to continue reading because someone would not stop rustling around in their tent next to me. At first, I thought it may have been a female counselor searching for something, but the rustling continued for around five more minutes. I got eager to see what was going on so I unzipped my tent 
and I poked my head out to look at the direction of the person. It was a clear day, so I saw who was there. It wasn't one of the other kids. It was a man. I thought maybe he was a male counselor, but all the counselors have colorful uniforms and boots to be recognized with. Yet this man was wearing camo pants with a leather jacket. I think that he heard me zipping the tent because he stopped rustling and crawled backwards out of it. I quickly crawled back into mine and zipped up the entrance. I was breathing pretty heavily, so I covered my mouth with my hand. Then the footsteps started. They were coming right around toward my tent. I think that he didn't know where I was since we were in a cluster of other tents. I saw his shadow though, walking right past my tent. And thanks to his silhouette, I saw that he appeared to be carrying an ax. I mean, not a hatchet, but a big tree cutting ax. Thankfully, he walked right past my tent. I waited a good while before unzipping the entrance just a little bit, just to see my surroundings. There were only trees and tents, just like before. The man was gone. I stepped out slowly, being cautious still, yet I still didn't see anyone around. I went to check the path the man had walked. There were some boot prints on moss. They were huge. I went over to check the tent he was looking around in. The girl that owned that tent, her clothes were scattered around inside. Her backpack was unzipped, and the entrance was left open. Something tells me the girl hadn't left her clothes like this. I ran to the fireplace as fast as I could and told the counselors what happened. They looked worried and we hurried back there. I showed them the boot prints in the tent. The owner of the tent soon realized that several pieces of her underwear and clothes were missing. Even after what happened, the counselor still wanted us to stay in the camp and asked us not to call the parents just yet. That was a bunch of bull to me. Safety should be top priority, and if there was some crazy guy walking around with an ax, none of the kids should still be here. For the rest of the time I was there, I didn't leave my sister's side, because I was terrified of that man coming back. Yet, nobody saw the man again, and nobody else's personal things were taken after that but I can tell you for sure that I'm not going back to that camp. Seven, Massachusetts Skinwalker by Aaron. It was the early 2010s. I was around seven years old. I was in my backyard camping since I've never been camping before and my parents thought it would be fun and cute to let me camp in the backyard. They even joined me. After a fun night around the campfire, it's time to hit the sack. We crawled into the tent and quickly dozed off, but something in the middle of the night woke me up. I had to use the bathroom really bad. I crawled over to my mom and rubbed her shoulder lightly, saying that I needed to go pee. She grumbled and told me to go outside near the tree. I did as she told me and steadily walked over to the tree outside the tent. As I did my business, I remember being nervous for two reasons. One, it was very dark, and at that age, I was afraid of it. And two, all of the sounds I had fallen asleep to, night birds and insects, they had gone silent, as if they'd disappeared. But soon, a noise did interrupt the silence. At first, I thought it was my mom calling me, but it wasn't coming from the tent. It was coming from in front of me, where the hedge and the metal fence met. It was calling to me. I ended up turning back and forth, looking at the hedge, then back to the tent, wondering what was going on. Did I not just crawl over my mom to get out of the tent? Who was talking to me? As I looked at the hedge more closely, I managed to make out a figure standing there, a figure whose skin was wrinkled every inch, as if withered away by hundreds of years of age. And I saw its mouth move, and my mother's voice came out. That's when I screamed. I ran back to the tent, and surprisingly, no one had been awakened by my screaming. I huddled up close to my mother, and I closed my eyes, 
trying to pretend that I was just sleeping. A few hours later, I was saved by the sunrise. Groggily, I helped my parents clean up. I never again asked my parents to camp out in the backyard. Even when they thought it'd be fun and asked me, I refused. But I never told them what I saw because I don't know what I saw. Eight, National Forest Monster by Abner S. I really loved the summertime, so when summer arrived in 2005, I was already starting to plan a little overnight camping trip in a national forest only a couple towns away from where I live. I always go alone, and this would be my first time going to that specific national forest. I guess with this trip I was unprepared, because while getting there, I had realized that I forgot to bring a ground cover for my tent, since I didn't use a tent with a built-in ground cover at the time. Plus, I forgot some other small things. I was already more than halfway to the forest, so I said screw it and kept on going. It was going to be night soon anyway. Things only got worse when I encountered a ton of traffic on the highway, throwing me a couple of hours off schedule. On my way there, I camped glancing at the sky and looking at the sunset. It was already getting dark. After around 20 minutes of driving from the exit, I got to the mountains and there was nothing but trees on either side of the road. So I thought that I was already in the park. I did think to myself for a split moment how it was weird that I never saw any entrance signs, but my main focus was trying to find a good spot, any spot, to camp for the night. After 20 more minutes of driving through pure forest, the road turned to gravel, and I thought to myself, this has to be some sort of camping area, right? Looking back, I should have turned right there, but I was exhausted and tired of driving. I finally settled on parking near a clearing on a dirt path, and I set up my camp there. When I got out of my truck, things seemed pretty normal. The only thing out of place at the time was that there were no other sounds except for the crickets and the sound of me setting up my camp. There was no wind, no frogs, owls, or any other people, just me and the crickets. It was already getting late by that point, a little past nine, so I had my dinner, sat around the campfire for a little bit, then climbed into the tent to sleep. I found myself awakened. I checked my watch and it was a quarter past 11. I thought I woke up because the bare ground had made my back stiff, but my back felt fine. I came to the conclusion that I just woke myself up randomly, so I closed my eyes and tried to get back to sleep. But then I heard a deep, raspy, far in the distance. I sat right up. What in the world was that, I thought to myself. That didn't seem like a howl or a growl of any animals I knew. I went back down in my sleeping bag, desperately thinking to myself a logical explanation as to what that sound was. Maybe it was an owl being killed by a wolf or something. I don't know. After around two minutes of trying to fall back to sleep, I was immediately jolted straight awake by the same sound, this time right next to the wall of my tent. In pure shock, I immediately jolted up, bust out the front of my tent and ran straight in the opposite direction of where the thing was. I didn't look back, and I didn't even catch a glimpse of whatever it was. I was running for only a couple of seconds when I slipped down a hill. Keep in mind, I was barefoot and in pajamas. I tumbled for a few seconds, and then, once I stopped, I tried to keep as motionless as possible. Maybe the thing didn't see me fall, I thought. I didn't want to give away where I was lying. I listened. There was nothing. I waited a little longer, but still nothing. I slowly peeked over the hill, trying to see as much of my campsite as I could in the dark but I could not see any of it. While doing this, I noticed that the crickets were now quiet as well. It was just pure silence. I didn't hear any leaves crunching either. It seemed to be all clear. 
that I was able to make a beeline for my tent to grab my pack bag, which had some miscellaneous stuff in my wallet in it, but most importantly, my keys. I knew I'd have to do it quick. So I tried to get to my car as fast as possible while making the least amount of noise. Every time I stepped on a leaf or twig, I cringed. I successfully got the bag and started opening it ever so slightly to get my keys. Once I got the keys, I went over to the car, unlocked it, and ignited it. Once I did this, I started to floor it out of there. I knew I shouldn't have done what I was going to do next, but I took one look back at the tent. Crouching down right beside the tent was the thing. Even in the darkness, I could make out its features. Its eyes were completely black, body covered with short white hair and the overall body structure was barely that of a person. I knew it saw me, because once it did, the creature let out that horrific sound again, that all too familiar. I punched the gas pedal on my car. I didn't stop until I got to a hotel far away from the forest. I got a room and immediately collapsed into the bed exhausted. I had a nightmare that night of the creature looking at me through the hotel window, slowly and steadily letting out that horrific sound. I jolted awake to the sound of nothing but my own heavy breathing and the crickets outside. Now, this may have been paranoia, but I think, sitting in that hotel room, trying to fall asleep again, I think I may have heard that discernible screech off in the distance. Nine, The Camping Skinwalker by B. Bo. It was May 27th, 2008. It was a Thursday when this happened to us. It was my 12th birthday and my mom decided to book a five day forest camping trip. I've always loved camping and I needed some fresh air from playing too much PS3. I arrived with no problems apart from forgetting my spare trousers. On Monday, we did some archery, and on Tuesday, we went rock climbing, and on Wednesday, we made little boats and saw if they would float. Every night, we'd hang out around the campfire and sing songs, make s'mores, and play Chinese whispers. On Thursday, things changed. I woke up that night to see that Andrew and Callum, two people in my tent, were gone. I unzipped the tent to investigate. I listened closely, and then I heard it. It sounded like Callum, and he was screaming for Stan. Terrified, I zipped my tent back up, and I laid down, covering myself with my sleeping bag. Later on that night, Callum and Stan never returned, but I did see an oddly tall shadow walking around my tent extremely slowly. I don't think that was a counselor. The next day, I reported it to the counselors that Andrew and Callum were still missing. There was a search party, and they ended up finding the two boys huddled together in the forest under a makeshift shelter. They were shivering and scared and complaining about coyotes, even though we're not supposed to have those here. It was definitely strange. I just wish I knew what they had seen that night. And 10, Ghost Girl in the Cabin by Mayamu. When I was in school, every year the sixth graders went on a week long camping trip to the coast. It's called sixth grade camp and it was really fun. That year, my class went down to Mendocino to stay the week in the woods next to the coast. Everybody got split up into groups of three to share a cabin. So my two friends, Emma and Lauren, and I got set up in a cabin named Cabin One. Everything was great. The cabin was small, but it was well kept for the most part. We had a rule though, that when one of us had to use the restroom, we would have to wake up another person to go with us, a sort of bathroom buddy, because the woods were very creepy at night, and the bathroom was a long hike up the hill. One night, I was awakened by the sound of footsteps coming from the back of the cabin to the front, where my bed was situated. 
they just kept going back and forth really loudly. So I thought it was one of the girls who needed to use the restroom. Maybe she was debating which one of us to wake up, or if she even had the guts to wake one of us up. I listened for a bit, confused and waiting for someone to speak up and ask if we wanted to go to the bathroom with her. But there was just silence, just footsteps going back and forth. I decided to look up from my pillow, and what I saw scared me half to death. It was a little girl dressed in a nightgown, standing over my bed. She was looking down at me. At first, I thought it was Emma, because she kind of looked like her. Short, curly blonde hair and a small round face. But then I remembered, Emma wasn't wearing a nightgown. I was petrified. I pulled my head under my blanket and prayed for it to go away. I fell asleep eventually, too scared to uncover at all. The next day, I asked Emma if she had gotten up last night at all, and she gave me a really confused look, saying no. That day, we found a really old family photo stuffed in the rafters of the ceiling. In it, there was a little girl with blonde curly hair. I don't know if she died here in the camp, or if that was even a ghost at all, or a demon pretending to be a little girl. Either way, it scared the absolute crap out of me. Bigfoot in West Texas, from Choi2719. Back in 2013, I was in a Boy Scout camping trip in Northwest Texas. I'd barely turned 13, which was the minimum age to register for high adventure programs. I accepted a particular challenge of hiking seven miles away from the base camp to a secluded camping location surrounded by mountains. I need to address the fact that we were really secluded out there. Our only source of light was the moon and a couple of flashlights. In addition, the program was a historical reenactment of Texas ranchers from the 1800s, which meant the camping spot had a small corral with two goats and a few hens. I felt somewhat safe as we were only seven scouts and three staff members. Safety in numbers, right? If we had any medical emergencies, it would be an hour wait for an ATV to reach the campsite, and another hour for that ATV to reach base camp. To make things sound worse, the fact that the campsite was in between the mountains, that meant we did not have any cell phone signal. The first few days were very uneventful. We just worked on merit badges and swam in the river. The second night was when all hell broke loose. I woke up at around one in the morning to go use the outhouse. I tried to wake up my buddy, but he just told me to stop being scared as he covered his face back up with his sleeping bag. So I grabbed my flashlight and took the 20 meter walk to the outhouse. As I was walking, the goats were making these sounds. This only put me further on edge. It's weird how creepy goats can be at night. I entered the outhouse and while I was doing my business, I heard small objects hitting the wooden structure. I took out my Swiss Army pocket knife and trying to sound as intimidating as possible, I said, Julian, cut it out. But I did not hear a response. Instead, I heard loud footsteps roaming around the outhouse. I turned off my light and prayed that whoever or whatever was outside would just leave me alone. After eight extremely long minutes passed, I could no longer hear the footsteps. Even so, I stayed inside that outhouse for 10 more minutes just to be safe. After those extra 10 minutes of nothing, I slowly opened the wooden door. I scanned my surroundings, but there was nothing out of the ordinary in my perimeter. I took a deep breath and swallowed. Then I booked it back to my tent then covered myself in my sleeping bag. I could not sleep all night, and once the sun came up, I asked Julian, Hey, nice try, but it's going to take more than a couple of rocks to scare me. Julian looked up at me, giving me this weird look, and said, What do you mean, dude? I didn't leave the tent all night. Confused and worried, I began to wonder who could have been outside that outhouse. 
There was no way it wasn't someone playing a prank on me or trying to tease me as I used the bathroom. The following two days went by very fast, and at last it was the day to pack up camp and hike back to base camp. But the scoutmaster woke everyone up at 3 a.m. For some reason, he kept rushing all of us to pack only what we could carry, and ATV could come get the rest of the stuff later. An older scout asked why we had to leave six hours early. The scoutmaster responded, You don't want to hike when it's 90 out, do you? We all agreed. We then began our hike back to base camp. The scoutmaster and staff began to hurry us even more, jogging on the trail now. Being the youngest and the smallest, I was lagging behind to the point that I was alone on the trail. I stopped to catch my breath, and that's when I heard a sound that I will never forget. It was a whooping sound echoing through the mountains. I whispered under my breath, the hell is that? Then I heard another whoop. I burst into a run down the trail, desperate to catch up with my peers. As I ran, I could hear footsteps that sounded like the ones that I heard when I was defenseless in that outhouse. I shone my flashlight to the surrounding woods. Two amber eyes shone back at me. I thought my fear was taking the best out of me, but then I saw the eyes getting closer and closer. Then they blinked. I screamed running down the trail, hearing occasional whooping sounds a good distance away behind me. After running for six minutes straight, I caught up with the troop who were wondering where I'd been. I asked the others, did you, did you guys hear those sounds? Before anyone could speak, the scoutmaster sternly told us, stay quiet, you boys. You need to conserve your breathing. We have another four miles left to reach base camp. I nodded, and I kept walking with them, this time making sure to keep pace with them no matter what. We reached the base camp at around 8 a.m. The campers stared at us as we all looked like we had seen a ghost. I slept in a cafeteria chair for about three hours until some ATVs flew by with some hiking bags. I recognized my black High Sierra backpack. I went to wake up my troop to pick up their bags, it turns out, when we reached the base camp, the staff mem the scoutmaster asked some of the staff members to help pick up our belongings. As I went to thank the staff members for helping pick up our gear, one of them looked at me very pale. He had walked away from the ATV and went right to the main office. After leaving our gear at the cafeteria, my troop as well as the staff members were called into the main office. Once we shut the door, the main scoutmaster told us, You boys were really brave getting out of your comfort zone in the mountains. Just be careful with mountain lions. They normally don't attack humans, but it is best to take precautions. Please do not tell anyone about this trip. We don't want the scout organization to lose membership over a territorial mountain lion. We all responded with a quick yes, sir, then walked out of the office without saying another word. Since one of our scouts had a merit badge that needed to be completed at base camp, we decided to spend the night here. Even if I was now surrounded by more than 300 scouts, I still felt uneasy about being out in the woods. That night, we had permission to sleep in the cafeteria as the staff members weren't able to get our tents back yet. I still didn't feel safe there, not even with four walls surrounding me. I just wanted to get back to civilization. At around 2 a.m., I woke up, and after tossing and turning for a few minutes, I decided to stare out the window to pass the time. I began to adjust my eyes to the darkness, staring at two squirrels running around a small clearing. I watched the squirrels dart around and into the dense vegetation nearby. I then looked around, thinking that maybe another scout had scared them away but what I saw gave me nightmares for days to come. There was no person out there. Instead, it was a gorilla-looking creature walking upright straight into the clearing where the squirrels once were. 
I could not believe what I was looking at. That creature stood staring at the main campground as everyone else slept. I wanted to call my scoutmaster, but I was paralyzed with fear. This hairy gorilla-looking thing, the creature, it must have stood at least six feet tall, judging by the tree it was next to, which my scoutmaster had been standing against earlier. I looked back at my sleeping troop members. Despite being surrounded by my own kind, I felt so helpless. When I looked back at the window, the thing was gone. After the longest five minutes in my life, I was able to move and me being just a naive young boy, I covered myself in my sleeping bag until the sun came up completely. When the sun was high in the sky, we placed our belongings in the van and drove away. The ride back home was quiet. Everyone was either looking out the window or sleeping. I was relieved to be out of that secluded campground. Years after this incident, I spoke to another scout who had been there recently. I asked him about the trail, and he said, Ah, man, that trail's been closed since 2013, but no one really knows why. But I know why. To this day, I believe that what I saw was a Bigfoot, but I made a promise not to speak about what happened in that Texas campground, but I need to know if anyone else has had a similar experience out there. I can't be the only one, right? I think it chased us from bouncing brick. Aside from a few odd occurrences here and there, this was my very first paranormal experience. Frankly, seven years later, I still have no idea what really happened. When I was in seventh or eighth grade, my parents let me have a few friends over to spend the night for my birthday. To set the scene a bit, it was August in Wisconsin. We would spend the night outside in a tent so as to not disturb my parents with giggling and acting up and whatnot. At about midnight that night, all but me and a girl named Rose had fallen asleep in our little campsite. We decided to walk around a bit. We lived out in the country, so we had a large plot of land surrounded by nothing but fields and trees. Thanks to the fact that we weren't close to the city, the sky was beautiful that night clear enough to see the Milky Way. It was honestly the perfect night to walk around talking about life. It was pleasantly warm and just a bit breezy. We walked around the yard for about two hours, talking about our beliefs, our families, and what we thought we wanted to do with our lives. At one point, we had stopped to look at the stars. I shot a passing glance towards the north edge of the yard, which bordered an empty field. Then I had to do a double take, because I saw something out there. There was this solid black blob, just floating there at the edge of the yard. Yes, floating. That sounds ridiculous, which is why I thought I was just seeing things in the dark. It gave off no sound and no smell. It just floated there, kind of changing shape. If you've ever seen a video of water in zero gravity, it moved a bit like that, but slower. I felt no presence from this thing whatsoever, so clearly I was just hallucinating, right? Hey Rose, I said, refusing to take my eyes off of that figure. I think I'm seeing things or something. She looked away from the stars to give me a confused look. What? What are you seeing? She asked. I pointed to the thing and asked her if she could see it. What is that? She wanted to know after staring at it for a few seconds. I asked her to describe what she was seeing to make sure we were seeing the same thing and to make sure she wasn't just playing along. But she described it in the exact same way I did for you. Keep in mind that the moon was bright and high overhead that night. We could see clearly for miles, except for the trees in the way, of course. 
so this was not some obscure shadow. Speaking of which, it was somehow darker than anything I'd ever seen, and it was in the middle of a flat, brightly lit piece of land. We were both looking at it. Is that a bear? She asked, grasping at straws. It's not touching the ground. How could it possibly be a bear? I replied. We still didn't feel anything from it. This whole time we were just staring at it, confused. You want to get closer to it? She asked me. I agreed, and we began to slowly walk towards it. It still didn't move. It didn't change. It didn't do anything at all. We stopped when we were 10 yards away from it. We stared some more until it began to change shape again. It was nothing drastic. It just narrowed ever so slightly in shape. It got skinnier and taller all at once. It still made no noise or anything. All of a sudden though, it had a presence to it and it was not a good one. There was a sudden pressure and weight among us. It was the most intense feeling of panic I've ever experienced in my life. It felt like getting hit by a freight train. I've never felt panic like this. Hell, I rolled my car going 70 on the highway once, and the feeling I got when the tires picked up off the road does not even compare to the feeling this thing gave me. I froze. I just couldn't move. I couldn't even speak for that matter. Oh God, I thought coming towards us. Despite the fact that it never appeared to get closer, this was what was running through my mind. All it was really doing though was maintaining that taller shape, as if on cue. Rose mimicked my thoughts aloud. It's running at us. She screamed and grabbed my arm, snapping me out of the trance and pulling me back toward the campsite. The feelings of panic vanished quickly after we began running so we actually ended up coming back later with the flashlight. As you could probably guess though, it was long gone and there wasn't a trace of anything left. We managed to fall asleep okay that night. Thankfully, I haven't seen anything like that since on that land and seven years later, I'm rather well versed in different cryptids and creatures around here, but nothing I've ever come across or heard of matched the description of this shape. Summer Camp Creature from CJ. When my grandpa was 14 to 15 years old, he went to a summer camp with a couple of friends of his. The camp was in the middle of a forest next to a little river, which connects to a lake. This was where my grandpa's gang was hanging out. My grandpa told me that they heard something strange on the first day coming from the woods they were walking around the campsite when something agile, fast, and huge began to move in the woods. On that first night, they heard something banging on the door to their cabin, but as they went to the door to check who it was, they heard something huge stomping around, then running back to the forest. When they opened the door, whoever it was was gone. When the next day rolled around, there was this day of doom as my grandpa called it, they had a little campfire in the woods with some other campers. When the other campers were leaving, saying their goodbyes, to return to their cabins, the moment they were gone, something like a massive branch or even a tree snapped in half behind the remaining campers. When a couple of the guys went to investigate, all they found were thin, human-like footprints, but they definitely weren't human. These footsteps led to a cave-like structure, they couldn't make out much as it was dark already. They began to enter the cave, but were immediately hit with the most foul stench coming from it. Beyond that, there were corpses of animals. Many of them were stacked together, but all of them had had their chests ripped open. But that wasn't the worst thing they found in that cave. They soon stumbled upon something that was gnawing at one of the bodies. Something that was thin, with spikes on its back. The group of them began to run from the cave. They did not have the right arms to protect themselves, so they ran out and ran back to the campsite, hoping that the strange-looking creature never noticed his human intruders. 
but when the scream came from that cave, they realized that they had just made it mad. They ran into the cabin and stayed up all night, watching the windows and hoping that that thing did not come for them. My grandpa was happy to get out of that cave alive and still does not know what kind of monster they saw. My camping experience from Aaron 23411. I live in Alaska and this story took place when I was about 10. During the summer, I always went camping. On this occasion, I went camping with my best friend, Anna, and her family. During this summer, her father wanted to go to the middle of nowhere and camp. I wasn't as up for it as the usual camping trips, but I didn't want to stay home, so I went with them. As we were entering the campsite, I was kind of spooked by a sign that read, Beware of Bears. Being little, I thought that I was sure to get attacked if I was left alone. Also, we left early in the morning that day and did not make it to the campsite until 2 p.m. I was really tired and sore from being in the car so long and eventually I got out of the car to help unpack. The camp we went to was surrounded by woods, of course, and had a little pit for a fire. It was actually a great spot for our tent. Later on, we finally got settled, and Anna wanted to go fishing. There was a lake and a stream nearby, so that's perfect. We grabbed our fishing poles and tried to leave on our own, but we were stopped by her family, who told us not to go alone, so they made us go with her brothers. We had to make our own path, and her older brother had a machete to cut a path. It took us a while to get to the stream, but we made it. While we were fishing, a sudden chill went down my spine. I said that I was ready to go back, but then Dan, the oldest brother, got frustrated because we had just got here, really, and if I wanted to go back, I'd have to go back on my own. Anna said not to worry, that we could go back together. So together, we left down the path that we had just taken, but in fact, this was a different path. We had gotten them confused. We didn't realize this until we made it to a dead end. We were surrounded by raspberry bushes and began to freak out. Out of nowhere, we heard someone walking through the woods around us. They were coming towards us slowly. I said it could be a bear. We freaked out even more because we couldn't see a thing through the thick underbrush. When I saw smoke coming from a fire not too far away, I grabbed Anna by the arm and we began to run towards it. Thorns and low-hanging branches did their damage to us, leaving us with cuts and bruises. But we didn't care, as we did not want to get caught by whoever was following us. The one time I looked back, I saw a tall man rushing through the woods after us, a man with an angry look on his face, along with a long and massive beard. He looked like he had been living in the forest his whole life. I screamed and ran faster until we burst into the campsite, the man did not follow us that far, but we were safe now that we were back. I do not know what he wanted to do with us that day, or who he was. I mean, for all I know, he could have been trying to help, but I wasn't going to take the chance to do that. I've never gone camping in that area again. I'm a bit too scarred from that experience. Camp Creeper from Anonymous I was 11 years old. I was going camping with my girl guiding troop for the weekend. I had missed my drama club and a singing audition, so I hoped it would be worth the trip. Because I was one of the youngest there, I was fuming when I was told we were in a tent meant for four, but I was sharing it with seven other people. After I set up my sleeping bag, my best friend and I decided to go into the disco our troop had. No one else, just our troop. It was just me and my best friend along with two other people, as well as the DJ at the time. Now, me and my friends did not pay much attention to him until my best friend pulled me aside and whispered, I think that DJ's looking at us weird. I think he's checking us out. At the time, I believed every single conspiracy theory on the internet, so 
so I was of course believing and suspicious. I remember I was dancing with my friend when I made eye contact with him. Like any preteen girl, I was kind of embarrassed, but when he locked eyes with me, I knew then that what she said was right. He must have been watching us for a while. When we got back to our tent, we joked around about him with the other girls, but he still creeped me out. The next day, or should I say night, there was another disco, but this one was huge in comparison. There were about 25 other guide districts there, and it was now only three of us, including my best friend, in our little group. We ran in and started dancing. It was the same DJ again, though, so I felt uncomfortable right away. He was still looking at me and my friends despite so many people being here. At one point, I left to go to the bathroom, and I just didn't go back. The next day, we did this fitness thing, five sessions in a row to be exact. And for some reason, that creepy DJ was also there. While we were being kids who were wanting to lose weight, the DJ was packing up his stuff because it was the last day of camp. He was standing there for five sessions straight, just watching us, staring at us with a smile. Remember, I was 11 at the time. The other girls weren't much older either. After that camp was over, I wish that I had gone to that audition instead. Was it a dog man? By Lacrimosa. A year ago, I went on a camping trip with my dad in late July. It was a weekend trip. We apparently were the only ones at that Indiana campground. One night in my tent, I woke up with a start. I checked the time on my phone, which read 3.30 a.m. I should have been asleep still, but my bladder was screaming. I was hesitant at first to get out of the tent, but I would not be able to go to sleep without this business getting done. I climbed out of the tent and stumbled around in the dark. The sounds of the forest around me at any other time would have comforted me, but on that particular night, those sounds were unnerving. About 50 yards away and up a hill, there was a porta potty, and being a girl, I can't just pee in the woods, and if I have the option, I'd rather avoid it. I had grabbed a headlamp my mom had loaned me. I clicked it on, and I began to make my way to the porta potty. To try to calm my nerves along the way, I was talking to myself mostly complaining about my bladder and how dim the headlamp was. The light was so faint that it only illuminated about five feet in front of me. All I could really rely on was the light of the moon. I soon made it to the porta potty without incident and I relieved myself. Once I was done, I began to make my way back to the tent. But once I was halfway there, it struck me on the way there, the forest was loud and eerie, but now the forest was quiet and even more eerie than before. With that silence disturbing me, my mind began to imagine the horrors of the forest that might be lurking around me. Monsters of folklore, boogeymen, psychos, anything could have been waiting for me just out of range to snatch me up and even eat me. Ugh, you know what your brain does when you're scared. It likes to make you being scared even worse. With the speed of an Olympic runner, I sprinted the last 20 yards back to camp. By then, the headlamp's light was fading. Upon arriving at the camp and catching my breath, I soon had the strange sensation that someone was watching me. I turned toward the tree line that bordered the lake. I was not expecting so soon to be looking into another pair of eyes, large yellow golden eyes. Unfortunately for me, my tent is extremely close to the tree line. So whatever was watching me, it was less than 15 feet away. Frozen in fear, the only thing I could think to do was stare back at them. And that's when my headlamp's light went out but the eyes of that creature, they glowed even brighter now, just from the dim moonlight. 
I like to think I'm a rational person, so I figured it was a coyote or a large stray dog, but every second that passed by, I was doubting that assumption. I took a few steps back and lost my balance, falling onto my butt, but the eyes got closer and the moonlight shone brighter on the creature's body. It soon revealed a silhouette that in no way whatsoever matched the size of a coyote or dog. It was far larger, and it appeared to be standing on two legs, as if mimicking a person. If I had to guess, the creature stood about six feet, even though it was hunched over. It had the head of a dog, kind of like a husky or wolf dog. Now, I know most people when they talk about encountering dogmen, they mention a strong feeling of malevolence coming from the creature. But with my experience, besides the feeling of terror I had, the eyes of the creature didn't seem to hold any sort of malice or intent to harm me. They looked curious, or maybe even confused. After engaging it in a staring contest, the creature lowered itself to all four legs, then slowly turned and walked into the forest, and creepily enough, it made no sound as it did so. Was this a dog man? I know it wasn't a bear, but I'm at a loss as to what it really is. It left no tracks behind either, as if it was extremely light, or like it wasn't there at all. The thing is, the soil on those banks is muddy, so something should have been left behind, something more than just me being terrified. The Little Black Dog by Witch Witch When I was around 10 years old, I had a horrific encounter that I have not been able to shake off. My family and I were on a flight over to Arizona. The flight over from Australia was long and tiring. When we finally landed, we collected our luggage and took a shuttle over to the campsite that we would be staying at. We arrived and set up our tents, but I demanded that I have a tent with my older sister. So she and I set up our tents and got ready for the night. After setting everything up and after a very long flight, Everyone was quickly exhausted. Even so, we stayed up long enough to make some s'mores in front of the campfire with a local ranger who stopped by. Now, this ranger had a black dog named Ziggy. As we were chatting, I could hardly keep my eyes open, so my mom thought it would be best if we all got some sleep. Before we went off the bed, I asked the ranger if he wouldn't mind if I had his dog sleep with us in our tent. He didn't mind, but he did ask me to return him the next morning. Everyone had fallen asleep, and I was awake with Ziggy lying at my feet. All of a sudden, Ziggy rose to attention, and he slowly began to creep toward the door. When I saw this, I could feel my heart pounding faster. I hadn't shut the tent properly last night, and it was unzipped at the bottom. Ziggy puts his head through to the outside, and I rush over to my sister and shake her awake. I point to the tent. My sister holds her finger to her mouth, making sure that I don't say a word. She slowly advances toward Ziggy when he jumps back whimpering quietly. My sister jumps forward and zips the tent shut, then grabs her phone and turns on the flashlight. That's when the scratching started. It was coming from just outside the tent. It started up the back and was just barely quiet. Then it seemed to advance, getting louder and faster as it came closer to the zipper. Ziggy growled and backed into the corner. My sister and I shuffled back as well, just watching. I whispered to my sister, shouldn't we call our mom? And she shook her head, but then, the most horrifying thing happened. Shouldn't, Shouldn't we, we call, call our mom? mom? Someone repeated exactly what I said, and the voice came right outside the tent entrance. They had imitated me the moment that I had said something, but the voice was distorted, as if its vocal cords had been fried. 
I had never been so scared before. I did not know what to do. It was like we were cornered in that tent. We had nowhere to go. Well, except toward the thing that had just mimicked me. We waited for several minutes. Minutes that slowly dragged by. My sister then crawled over to the entrance and slowly unzipped the tent door. Then she looked outside. I came up next to her and poked an eye out through the small hole. We saw what we thought looked exactly like Ziggy, but after a moment, we saw that it just wasn't right. His back was sort of caved in, and the hind legs were longer, and the body was wet and soaked. Then the thing that looked like Ziggy leered at us, straight in the eye. I shut my eyes fast and encouraged my sister to do so as well, and then I said to her that maybe we should scream to try to scare it off. So the two of us together screamed as loud as we could, and so highly pitched that Ziggy began to bark. I opened one eye and saw that the thing was running away now. My mom came rushing out and saw both of us screaming and crying. We told her everything and could not get back to sleep after that. The next morning, we saw the ranger and told him about our story. He told us that it sounded like a skinwalker. My mom, a bit irritated that he was trying to scare us, demanded that we leave early. So we did. We ended up staying at a cheap motel and then we flew back home shortly after. Nine years later, I've never been the same. Sleepwalking at the Girls' Camp by Pearl This took place when I was 12. While my mom was still with my stepdad, he forced me and my siblings to attend a Christian church, which to this day I still despise. At that church, they had a group called Young Women. I'll call it YW for short. Also, it's important you know that at that age, I used to sleepwalk. So YW had an annual camping trip that I had to go to. The place had a nice restroom reserved for the camping trip, and the owners of the camping ground had a nice black lab who hung around the camp the entire time I was there. I don't know why, but he chose to bond with me of all people, and I'm glad he did. It was on the second night of our stay that I slept walk into the restrooms. Some of the girls had stayed up late and saw me walking around apparently, not knowing that I was sleepwalking and had assumed that I got up to use the restroom. Not long after I entered, they saw an old man follow me inside. They said that he came right out of the woods and began to follow me. But before the man could actually make it inside the bathroom, that black lab spotted him and began to growl at him. The man, either fearing the dog or fearing that everyone would wake up from the dog growling, began to run away into the woods. The dog chased him and did not come back until the next morning. One of the girls ran into the bathroom to check on me and saw me lying on the floor, fast asleep. She gently woke me up and led me back to my tent. That group of girls was also brave and kind enough to guard my tent for the rest of the night. That very next morning, they would tell me this story, and as further evidence that the story was true, the black lab came back, and it had part of the guy's pants in his mouth, and he had a large scrape on his poor little head. If I had to guess, the dog had caught up to the guy and grabbed him by the pants, before being forced to let go after he was hit in the head. I had to explain my sleepwalking to the group, so they knew why I never reacted. We warned our camp counselors of the incident, and everyone else was on high alert for the rest of the trip. After hearing the story, the owners had the lab stay in my tent with me for the rest of the stay. So yeah, that's my close call experience with the guy who wanted to hurt me and I didn't even know it because I was sleeping. The Skinwalker in Broad Creek by Flat French Fry This 
This is a story about what I saw on my last camping trip with my friends from the Boy Scouts. Me and my friends at the time were going to the rifle range to finish up our rifle merit badge. We all had a good time, but I was the last one to finish up, so they ended up leaving me there until I was done, so that meant I had to walk back by myself. Our campsite was on the other side of the camp, and it's down a long gravel road. As I was walking through that gravel, I began to hear sounds in the forest right next to me. I simply thought it was another campsite, so I ignored it and continued on. But as I make it to the offshoot of this trail, to where the other camp should have been, I saw that their campsite was empty. Now I was beginning to get a little suspicious of these sounds in the forest. Sounds like footsteps and breathing. So I start to jog, nervous that something was following me. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I see it. Something with long, lanky limbs and eyes that reflected a dreadful yellow. I can see ribs pushing up from underneath its skin and bones that seemed angled and broken. I'm standing there in shock. I feel like I need to throw up. I see the form of the thing get closer and closer until I hear another sound, a smaller set of footsteps coming toward me. It's one of my friends coming to check on me since I was taking so long. He grabs me by the shoulder and we take off toward the camp. As I'm walking away, I look back and there that thing is walking right behind us, almost out of eyesight from the tree line. That's when I get a good look at its face, which is the most disturbing part of this story because the face is a human face, but it looks more like a loose mask as we get closer to our camp's campfire, the thing seems to grow disinterested and disappears into the trees. It was the strangest thing and the scariest thing that I've ever experienced. If I have anything to say, it would be don't go hiking alone in Broad Creek. The Hike I'll Never Forget by Dixon W. It was a hot and humid August day. My friend had come down here two days before on a Greyhound bus from Ohio. I live in Oklahoma, and it can get pretty miserable here. But that morning when we woke up, I told my friend that we were going to go hiking in the woods. I had been hyping it up for the past two days. We were both excited. I knew that he wanted to go hiking as much as I did. So after breakfast, this friend, Coda, and I drove about three miles from my town. The forest we went to was nothing but trees and fields, not even any trails or camping areas. This place was basically civilization free. As we began our hike, I noticed how quiet it was. I took a moment to appreciate it until I realized that even the birds were gone. I should have taken that as a warning but I didn't even think much more about it, besides remembering that there was a wildfire a week back, and maybe that had something to do with it. Anyway, for this trip, I did not even bring a map, since I'd been out here about a million times by now. It was going to be a two-day hike, because I didn't know how much Coda would be able to take. For the first couple of hours, Coda kept asking me if I felt like I was being watched, which in the middle of the forest is a really creepy question to ask. And to be honest, I did feel like that, but I did not want to spook him, so I lied and said no. By the time we got to the first campsite, we were trying to get things ready when things got weirder. As the sun set over the horizon, the air around us got colder and the sensation of being watched grew worse. It was so cold that I could see my breath. Anyway, we got settled in and soon went to bed. In the middle of the night, I woke up and saw that Coda had been up for about 10 minutes already. When I saw him just sitting up like that, it kind of startled me. I went to ask him what was wrong, but instead of letting me talk, he put a finger over my mouth and shushed me. 
It made me a little bit irritated, so I pushed his arm away. Then he said in a really low, quivering voice that there was something outside the tent. I laughed a bit, because all I heard at the moment were coyotes in the distance. I called him a coward and tried to go back to bed. But when I did, I felt the sensation of me being watched again. This time, it was nearly overwhelming. I sat up quickly, and my friend looked at me straight in the eyes and said, Do you believe me now? When the sun finally came up, it was really quiet again. I made us some breakfast, and then we got prepared to go hiking again. But after that night, I no longer felt safe out there. As my mind was racing, Koda suddenly came up to me and pushed me. I got up and looked at him, asking why the heck he did that. Koda looked at me with a serious look in his eyes, and he said, why'd you call me a coward last night? You know I hate that. You didn't believe me either. I shook my head and picked up my backpack. I just took off and didn't care for leaving him behind. There was just too much tension between Koda being frustrated and the strange sensations we were feeling. At this point, I just wanted to get our hike over with and get back home. I was maybe 200 yards ahead of Koda when I heard something. It was a really raspy voice, but it sounded like it was all around me, calling my name. I stopped in my tracks, listening to it, trying to pinpoint exactly where it was coming from, but it seemed to have no specific origin. It was coming from everywhere at once. Then, it began to sound like Coda, and instead of freaking out at this obviously supernatural thing that was happening, I started to feel bad for leaving Coda behind. He hadn't gone out here as much as I had, so he could have gotten hurt if I left him there. I ran back to camp. When I got there, he was sitting down on the forest floor, just picking at twigs. He looked up, and he said that he was sorry for pushing me. I helped him up and apologized for calling him a coward. Then I asked him, was it you that was calling my name a second ago? He looked at me with a raised eyebrow and asked me the same. We had both heard each other calling our names, but neither of us had actually done that. We were both creeped out. Together, we took off. We made quite a bit of progress, both of us now in an apparent hurry to get this over with. But we were getting tired. We started walking again, and that's when Coda started to get weird again. He stopped all of a sudden, and then he asked me, What was that? I looked at him, and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Did you hear something? Coda got red in the face, instantly growing furious for some reason. Then he just blew up. What do you mean you don't know? You've been here right by me, and you've been on so many hikes here in these woods. How do you not know what that was? I was getting annoyed again. I told him that I wasn't sure, and that I didn't hear anything. I didn't know what he was talking about. We needed to keep going. He stared at me in confusion and anger. Then he stormed off. Where are you going? I asked. We can set up camp here, but he kept going, only looking back for a moment to say, screw this, screw you, I'm getting out of here, I'm getting away from whatever that was. I didn't want to leave him alone, even though he was doing nothing but confusing me and scaring me now, so I followed him, even though it was night and we were both exhausted. We walked through the night until the sun was beginning to rise again. It must have been 7 a.m. by then, which was around the time we heard a blood-curdling scream, like an animal being attacked and slowly slaughtered. I stopped, petrified at what I just heard. All of a sudden, Coda grabbed me and pushed me forward, almost tossing me to the ground. We both began running, and only seconds later, we stopped, because we both saw something up ahead. It almost looked like a person, but everything about it was just all wrong. It only had patches of hair in places, and the arms were suffering from some sort of bone disease. 
because there was no way those arms were natural. We turned around and began to quietly walk back. But as we did, the thing was before us again, as if it had transmitted itself to a new location immediately. Now it was at the edge of the nearby tree line. We backed up slowly and just turned around, running in the other direction. As we ran, I kept seeing the thing out of the corner of my eye. It never really chased or pursued us, but every time I turned in a different direction, it was there. Maybe there were loads of this thing in the woods, or maybe there was one. I, I couldn't be sure. For another two hours, we kept up full speed, nearly doubling over or fainting. This was the furthest we had ever pushed our bodies. But soon, thank God, we made it back up the road and we found my truck. And only when we reached the road, when I turned to look back into the forest, I no longer saw that creature. It was like it popped out of existence the moment we exited the woods. This made me feel secure, but we were still way too close to danger. I didn't want to turn again and see it randomly pop up once more. I turned the truck on and we drove away, the two of us remaining silent until we got home. That was certainly a hike I'll never forget. I still go back in those woods sometimes, but I've never had this happen to me again. Still, I bring a weapon with me, just in case I see that thing. I wonder, are those woods haunted? Is that thing the source of it? Was it that creature that was making Koda and I turn on one another? I never honestly thought I'd experience something as bad or worse than a horror film, but here I am telling this story. Consider this next story a bonus story. It's not really the same as the other camping stories in this episode, but it does feature two campers of sorts taking care of an elderly lady. It's disgusting and disturbing, and I thought you would definitely love to hear it. The Ants of Rot by Ikmek L. When I was six years old, my parents broke up and divorced. My dad moved a few miles away to a large apartment building. This story took place around three years after he moved in. I would go to visit him on Wednesdays and every other weekend. Every time I would visit, there would be a person camping outside of one of the apartment buildings. When I say camping, I mean that the person, sometimes a man and sometimes a woman, would be sitting in a fold-up chair with their phone plugged into a socket along the corridor. I later learned that they were caretakers of a very elderly lady who did not like them inside her house, so she made them set up camp outside. One day in December, right before Christmas break, we started noticing a slightly strange odor looming around that corridor. We didn't pay much mind to this, as we had packing to do for the trip. As I recall, on the evening that we arrived back home, we heard a large amount of commotion in the corridor. Out of interest, we went outside. There were police everywhere. We managed to ask one of the officers what was going on. Apparently, an old lady had passed away. She had not given the building a spare key to her apartment, so the officers had to break in. And these doors here were real deal fireproof, two inch thick mechanisms with three locks. The amount of damage they had to give that poor door before it gave the slightest bit of entry was unbelievable. At this time, I felt bad for the old lady and soon forgot all about it. Around two months later, that nasty smell started to come back. My dad told me that somebody had probably gone on vacation but accidentally left their garbage. This smell seemed to be the strongest next to the door across from us. It got to a point where it became hard to breathe. Somebody complained and the authorities were called. Inside the apartment, they found the remains of a young female in an advanced stage of decomposition with an infestation of ants and maggots living off of her. Apparently, she had popped when they were trying to transport her 
launching maggots and ants everywhere. I later learned that she experienced a very slow and painful demise. She had constantly been eating a food that was actually poisoning her. She had passed away in her bedroom, which shared a wall with mine. Ever since then, until we moved, we suffered a small ant infestation. It scares me to this day that the ants that climbed on my bed were the same ones who climbed all over and feasted upon that woman. I don't know if it was a coincidence that those two people passed at the same time almost, on the same floor in the same building, and yet they had partially decomposed before anyone had found them. The Ghosts of Glastonbury Mountain From Mythology Loves Horror Growing up in Vermont meant bonfires, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and the most beautiful autumn leaves and the best maple syrup. It also meant the weirdness that is the region known as the Bennington Triangle, which I didn't learn about until the summer I turned 20. To this day, I wish I'd never found out about that cursed place. Diane, my best friend since childhood, had always been an avid ghost hunter. She loved dragging me along to anywhere that was supposedly haunted, even if we weren't allowed to be there. The Green Mountain Cemetery, Sabin's Pasture, and the Community College of Vermont were just a few of our many stops. I never believed in the supernatural. For most of my life, I thought that her midnight graveyard visits and trips to supposedly haunted buildings were a waste of time, more of a pastime hobby than an actual passion. My mind was forcibly changed in the course of a single night in 1983. Our junior year of college had started, and Diane proposed a weekend camping trip to one of the forests in the southern part of the state. She even promised that there wouldn't be any ghost hunting on this trip, which was a nice change of pace. I just wanted to relax for a few days out in nature before the harsh Vermont winter drove us to stay inside. A week after she set up the trip, we found ourselves in the middle of the woods outside the tiny town of Somerset, Vermont. It was the morning of October 12th, and soon we had set up a nice campsite. We planned to do some hiking and swimming while we were there, so the rest of the first day was spent in lazy bliss as we canoed, chatted, and fished. That night we cooked up the trout that we had caught, and it was a peaceful night spent under the stars. I slept great. I woke up feeling refreshed and excited for our hike the next day. We got an early start on our trek up Glastonbury Mountain, and by late afternoon we had reached the summit. We rested at the top for a while. We roasted some burgers over a small campfire for dinner. We made sure to thoroughly extinguish the fire, and as the sun began to bleed out, we made our way back down the mountain on the side that would bring us closer to our camp. I wasn't looking forward to hiking in the dark, but I knew I would be fine as long as I wasn't alone. Diane and I had also made sure to wear bright colors, myself in neon yellow and her in flame red, to make it easier to see each other. We'd been extra smart and had expected to be heading back to camp in the dark, so we even had headlamps ready to go when the last of the light began to fade. We made it about a third of the way down when we stopped, because we heard crying. We stopped mid-trail scanning the area around us, trying to see what it was. It was clearly the crying of a small child, not the woman-like cries of a mountain lion or another animal. I'd spent enough time in the woods to know the difference, and something about this cry unnerved me. Not a single person lived on the mountain itself, and we hadn't seen anyone at all in the time that we'd been there. I strained my eyes, but I could not see any other flashlights or lanterns through the dense thicket. I thought I caught a glimpse of something red moving further out among the trees, but she was heading off the trail and into the trees. I yelled at her to come back, but she refused, saying that she couldn't just leave a kid alone in the woods. I tried to point out that a family was probably camping nearby, but 
but she ignored me and kept walking towards the sound. Against my better judgment, I followed her, hesitating before I stepped off the trail. I didn't want her running through the inky wilderness and getting lost or hurt, but nor did I feel comfortable going off trail in a place that neither of us really knew. Within ten minutes, I regretted my decision. I'd been able to see her for the first few minutes, but then I lost sight of her shirt. Even the sound of her rapid footsteps crunching the dead autumn leaves began to fade, and no amount of shouting had brought her back. I listened, trying to pinpoint any sound, when I saw a flash of red out of the corner of my eye. I was so relieved that Diane had returned that I whipped around with a grin on my face. My relief was immediately replaced by confusion. No one was there, and after a few seconds, it dawned on me that I still hadn't heard a sound. A moment later, a tug on my sleeve made me scream. I looked down in horror, my heartbeat drumming in my ears, and I saw a little boy in a red jacket. He was looking up at me, with huge, tear-filled eyes, and I felt my fear soften slightly. Hey, kid, where are your parents? I, I don't know. Mom was here, but now she's not. I crouched down to eye level, making sure that my headlamp was not blinding him. What's your name? Paul. I'm Jeanette. It's nice to meet you, Paul. He stuck out his hand like a little adult, and I gladly shook it with an amused smile. He was a cute kid, and for the first time I was glad that we had gone off trail to find him. Now let's go look for your mom and my friend, okay? He nodded trustingly, and he slipped his hand into mine. We had no idea which direction to take, so we made our way further into the dense woodland. I kept us going in a straight line from the path. We made sure to call for Diane and his mom every few minutes. But I was getting more and more nervous about going deeper into the woods. Even so, I still could not bring myself to abandon my friend. Nearly two hours later, we ran into the trail again, and it was very close to our campsite. I was hoping that Diane had been smart enough to wait there for me if she had made it this far and I was extremely worried at this point. We both had a small flare gun on us in case of an emergency, and that was the only thing assuring me that she was still okay. I got a fire going, since Paul's hand was frigid, and I offered to warm him up some cocoa. He politely declined and curled up in a camping chair by the fire. I sat there in our other chair for about an hour, waiting for Diane to return, and at some point... I must have dozed off. When I woke up, there was a woman by the fire with a weirdly blank look on her face. I blinked rapidly to shake the sleepiness from my eyes, thinking she was just a dream. But the figure remained. I was confused, and I began to panic when it dawned on me who she was. Oh, you must be Paul's mom. I'm so glad you found us. My name is Paula. Oh, that's cute. You named him after you. He's not my child. Uh, I'm sorry? She hadn't moved, and the silence stretched tensely between us. I yawned and rubbed my eyes. I thought I was seeing things. A darkness began to seep from her body like a fog, and at first I thought it was just the firelight casting odd shadows or my eyes playing tricks on me. But it began to pull from her skeleton-like fingers and on to the ground. I swore, quickly scrambling back away from her out of my chair. By then, I noticed that Paul wasn't in sight. I screamed for him. The woman still hadn't moved, but the ooze had reached my tent. It began to dissolve the nylon like acid, its hiss warring with the crackling of the fire. I don't remember much after that, except for running towards the car and trying to explain to the police what had happened. They didn't believe me, of course. 
when we came back to the campsite. They blamed drinking and an unguarded fire for the state of the tent, even though there was no alcohol in my system. They began searching for Diane, but never found any trace of another person. Five years later, Diane's case went cold. I wouldn't be writing this down if my 12-year-old nephew hadn't asked me to go for a school project that he was working on. One about people who have seen ghosts. When I asked my nephew why he picked me to interview, he looked up at me, just like little Paul had done long ago. He handed me an old yellowed newspaper article, dated October 14th, 1950. There was a picture of a little boy on it, in a familiar red jacket, and the headline was about his disappearance near Glastonbury Mountain on October 12th, 1950. My nephew tugged gently at my sleeve, his eyes wide as he stared at the tears flowing down my cheeks. Don't cry, Auntie. Not everyone gets to meet two ghosts in one night. What do you mean, two? Yeah, don't you ever go to the library? I shook my head. He exasperatedly pulled out a second article from his school folder. This one had a picture of the woman I'd seen that night. It was about her disappearance from the same area in 1946. They had both been wearing red when they disappeared. And now that I remembered, so had Diane. I know I'll never go back there, but I believe that if I did go back, I would see three ghosts. A Michigan Monster from Mr. Smith. Are you ready for a good old-fashioned tale of kids getting in over their heads? The following events happened a long time ago, more than a decade, in fact, but I still remember most of the details quite clearly. For a bit of context, I was born and raised in a small rural town in the southeastern U.S., but at the time of this story... A sizable enclave of my family lived in the backwoods of the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Once a year, my parents and I would pile into the car and make the trip up to see my Michigan relatives, and we'd all converge on a small campground on the shores of Lake Superior for a three- or four-day reunion. I always looked forward to it, because that meant several days of enjoying home-cooked food by the lakeshore with family. I especially loved seeing all of my cousins, who were about my age. Plus, most of the older family members would either be preoccupied with catching up on gossip or busy making casseroles and other dishes for the cookout. This meant that all the kids were free to roam the beautiful shoreline of the lake or go hiking through the woods. Basically, we had unprecedented freedom. It was a blast. Well, usually. At this particular reunion, I was 13. Two of my cousins, Erica and Cody, were the same age as me. Another cousin named Dan was two years younger. Erica, Cody, and I always hung out together at the reunion, as we were the same age. The older cousins were too grown up to bother with us, but we were too old to be stuck with the little kids. Dan was the in-between, too old for the kindergartners, but too young for us, big and mature middle schoolers. He was funny and nice, though, so often enough we let him hang out with us. On the first day of that reunion, we did all the usual running around and swimming, but we decided that this year we would do something more daring, since we were practically grown-ups now, at least to us. To that end, we asked our cousin Bradley if there were any scary places nearby for us to explore. Bradley was kind of a jerk sometimes, but he was the youngest of the older cousins, so he was the most approachable. Besides, he was in ROTC at his high school and carried a pocket knife all the time. To us, he was pretty much as good as a space marine. Bradley acted annoyed at first, but eventually he caved and told us about a creepy abandoned farm that bordered the campground on one side. The fields were still used for growing wheat and corn, even though the house and equipment shed were run down and dilapidated. 
He even told us a spooky tale of how the farmer who lived there had gone insane and started to take local children. Supposedly, he ate them. Of course, this story was completely made up just to scare us, but at the time, it seemed quite real to us. So, with visions of an insane, fang-toothed farmer in our heads, we all decided this would be a great place to explore to show that we were fearless adults. We spent the rest of the evening biding our time, and once our parents were asleep, we snuck out of our cabins and met at one of the picnic areas. Erica was there first, and I arrived just a few minutes before Cody, but Dan didn't show up for a while. Just when we thought he had chickened out on us, he finally came through, trotting down the path from the cabin. After a bit of teasing, we decided that we should go ahead and get moving if we wanted to get back in time to catch a little bit of sleep. We had all brought flashlights and Erica had brought her new camera. She was going through a photographer phase at the time. The campground wasn't really that big, so we were able to make it to its edge on foot in just over half an hour. We jumped over the ramshackle split rail fence bordering the campground, and we could see the old farmhouse in the distance. There was just one little problem. It was on the far side of a head-high cornfield. But we did not want this to deter us from our little investigation of the property. We began to make our way through the tall cornfield. The corn wasn't quite ready to be harvested, so it was at least green and lush but not dry and creepy. In the midst of the foliage, the air was refreshingly damp and cool as we walked. We whispered to one another about what we would do if we encountered the crazy farmer, and we teased one another with pokes and prods, seeing who was on edge the most, who was jumpy. We finally made it to the edge of the cornfield, and the terrain opened up into an overgrown grassy yard surrounding the single-story farmhouse and a run-down equipment shed. Rusted and neglected farm equipment lay scattered around the yard, surrounded by high grass and weeds. Hay balers, box scrapes, cedars, you name it. The place definitely had the creepy vibe we were looking for, maybe even a little bit too much of it. We stood in silence for a moment, then Dan and Cody both suggested we should turn back and return to the cabins, as we had seen what we came for. Erica was braver though, and she said she wanted to get some pictures of the old shed in the farmhouse. Besides, she said, with a big full moon like that in the sky, I might actually be able to see some of these pictures. If I'm honest, I was feeling a bit creeped out myself, but I did not want to look like a coward and as we had come all this way, I figured we might as well have a look around. We headed to the equipment shed first, immediately spooking a barn owl with our lights, and all but dying of fright when it screeched at us. We poked around in the shed for a few minutes, the beams of our flashlights casting terrible shadows as they shone across the rusted tines and blades of forgotten machinery. And then we began to move towards the dilapidated house, However, as we walked, we kept hearing a rustling sound, as though somebody was moving out in the cornfield. Every time we stopped to listen, the sound stopped too, almost like it was following us. Erica was not about to be discouraged, though, so we finally made it to the house. The porch was rotted and practically falling in, and attached to the door was a slip of bright orange paper encased in heavy plastic lamination. It read, Notice of Eviction, and was dated nearly a year ago. The door was sturdy and locked. We didn't want to actually break in through one of the windows, so we circled back around the building and looked for another way inside. By now, the pacing in the cornfield had stopped, so we all began to relax a little, believing it to be a raccoon or something similar. As we rounded the corner to the back of the house, we noticed that the storm cellar doors were wide open, and we figured that would be our ticket inside. However, when we reached the gaping entrance to the cellar, we were greeted with a less than welcoming sight. The concrete floor of the cellar was covered in animal bones and shredded skins. 
deer, cattle, raccoons, dogs, birds, all skeletal or mostly skeletal. Likewise, the thick wooden doors of the cellar were covered in scratches and claw marks, like something sharp had been scraping against them regularly. The grass around the entrance to the cellar was worn down, and the dirt was packed from regular traffic. Anyone who has worked in taxidermy or forensics will tell you that old bones have a very particular smell. It's not exactly the smell of death or the scent of decay. It's something else entirely, and that cellar absolutely reeked of it. The four of us stood at the entrance of the cellar, open-mouthed and shocked. We stood stone still as though that would protect us from whatever it was that lived down there. Wordlessly, Dan and Cody backed away as Erica and I shone our flashlights down into the cellar, looking for any sign that there might have been something alive down there. But we saw nothing. Nothing but piles of bones and claw marks on the doors. That was more than enough to finally persuade Erica that she didn't need to get those pictures that bad. We all quickly made the decision to go back the way we came. We were debating if we should call the police, but then something stopped us in the middle of our whispered argument. A soft thud emanated from a rusted hay baler from halfway across the yard. It was followed up by the sound of something sharp scratching against metal. All of us looked at one another, exchanging a wordless, Did you hear that too? Look. We all shone our flashlights in the direction of the sound, and simultaneously, we all saw it. There on top of the rusty green baler was the shape of a large canine. It was way too big to be a coyote, and its fur was extremely dark. However, its outline was not quite right for a wolf either. Of course, it was hard to focus on anything except its piercing yellow-green eyes and the carcass of the two-point buck it held in its jaws. It didn't make any noise, no growling or snarling at all, but we understood the message it was communicating with its glare. A universal look that meant, leave. And leave we did. The four of us all ran headlong, screaming into the cornfield, making a desperate break for the safety of the cabins. Just as I was running into the field, however, I looked over my shoulder, making sure that the beast was not following us. It wasn't, but when I looked back, what I saw was almost as unsettling. The animal had stood up. It was standing on its hind legs, now holding the deer carcass in its arms as it watched us leave. I only looked back for a second, but I know what I saw. After that, the whole memory is a blur. I returned to my cabin and bolted inside, and I remember seeing Dan and Cody running by as I was fumbling with the door, followed shortly by Erica. We weren't feeling very grown up all of a sudden. I ran to my bed in the cabin, and I hid under the sheets, eventually falling asleep. The following morning, I wasn't even sure if everything from the night before was real, or it was just a bad dream. However, when my cousins and I met up for breakfast, we all agreed that what we'd seen was real. When I mentioned that I had looked back and I saw the monster stand up, Dan and Erica suggested that maybe it was Bradley playing a prank on us, as wolves obviously did not stand on two legs like that. The thing is, Cody then told us that when he had returned to the cabin, Bradley was sound asleep on the couch, and there was no way he could have beaten us home without us ever having seen him running ahead of us. And where the heck had he gotten such an elaborate costume? Besides, even though Bradley was a pretty big guy, 15 years old and over 6 feet tall, he definitely wasn't big enough to account for the height of the thing I'd seen the night before. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with farm equipment, but a full-size round baler is a big piece of machinery and this thing was more than half the height of the baler. It must have been seven feet tall at the very least. As these stories often say, I'm not sure what the thing was that I saw, but to this day whenever I talk to my cousin Erica, 
the subject of that night almost always comes up. She says her biggest regret is not stopping to take a picture of that basement full of bones, or the creature as it stood silhouetted against the brilliant light of the summer moon. But I always tell her that she did the right thing by just running away. The four of us have never told the rest of our family about our experiences there, and the farmhouse and outbuildings have since been torn down. Most of my family from that area has either died or moved away now, so we don't have the yearly reunions anymore. But I'll never forget what I saw that night, and if I ever go back, I'll be sure to be armed. After all, who knows if that thing is still out there? If you ever go out walking in the woods and farmland of the Upper Peninsula, take heed. There's something out there with claws, teeth, and a hell of a lot of fur. It walks on two legs, and when you meet it, it might be hungry, and it might just take you to its cellar. Warning, this story contains graphic depictions of hurt animals. I went camping when I was younger. From All Calm, 1999. This started when I used to live in a small town in Arkansas. It had a population of around 5,000. It was your average conservative town. In the summers, it was hot and humid. In the winter, it was dark and cold. I grew up on southern entertainment, driving four-wheelers, hunting every deer season, maybe even laying a bit of trapping here and there. This story occurred my last year of high school. I would have been 17 at the time. I had plenty of friends, a great girlfriend, and an old shabby 1972 F-100 Ford pickup. Of course, I have still got the pickup to this day. It was November, rifle season, and I'd been preparing for it for a while. My friend Drew and I had been planning this trip, and we had everything ready. It was Friday, the end of the week, and the start of the weekend. Our plan was to hike up through the National Forest onto the mountain, and then set up camp, and just have a great time. I woke at three in the morning, leaving a note for my parents, and putting my things in the bed of my truck. I hopped in and drove to my friend's house. When I arrived, he was already waiting on the porch. He placed his bag in the bed of the truck, then put the gun in the truck. After that, we took off to the mountain. We entered onto the turn that went through to the entrance of the hiking site. The change from road to dirt was just as familiar as ever. We stopped and got out, carrying our bags and heading up the mountain trail. It was around seven. Thanks to the sun shining over the trees, we were able to see where we were going easily. The birds were chirping, and I could see plenty of squirrels running through the trees and chattering at one another. About three hours of hiking later, we came up to the campsite that we followed with our map. As we arrived, we began to quickly set up tarps, and we were quick to find firewood and start a good fire. I told my friend that I would get us some lunch, and I headed off with my rifle to go get something to eat. I walked for at least half a mile south when I found myself breaking the tree line. I decided I'd sit and watch for a bit. I sat underneath a large oak and looked for any movement. The sun was rising slowly. I was sitting there when all the birds stopped for a moment. The silence became deafening. There was a sharp ringing in my ear. It was so eerie. I began to slowly scan my surroundings, making sure to stay as still as possible. I noticed then that there was a deer standing at the other side of the field. It was hard to make out. I slowly raised my rifle and looked down the hill. I only saw its head and neck from where I was. I knew that if I risked a shot then, that I wouldn't have another chance to bag another deer with a better shot. Regardless, it was a doe anyway. That's when I noticed something else. The deer's head was higher off the ground than most deer should be capable of, and it moved unnaturally. It turned to the left and I could hear leaves crunching as it moved deep into the dark forest. 
I was a little bit unsettled, so I decided to head back to camp and be handed. I followed the mental landmarks that I saw the first time. I fallen over a tree, dried up creek bed. Soon I could see the tarps in the distance through the trees. When I made it back to the campsite, we fiddled around for the rest of the day, shot up some rabbits, and later we decided that it was time to catch some sleep. I crawled into my tent, admittedly exhausted, and got into my sleeping bag. It didn't take long for sleep to come. We got up early the next morning. It was still as eerie as it was the day before, and felt so desolate. Again, the animals were quiet, just utter silence. It was strange, because the air felt heavy too. There weren't even birds today, no deer, no rabbits or anything. We went our separate ways. We were getting hungry, and when the sun set, we had been nestled down waiting for some game to come around. It was getting dark again fast. We met back up later, and were forced to eat some of the cans of beans that we had packed, just in case we had nothing to shoot. As we ate in quiet, Drew got up from his seat and said to me, I'll be right back. Gotta take a pass. I stayed there drinking some water, watching the fire dance rapidly. As the minutes passed by, I grew painfully aware that Drew had been gone for a long time. I was starting to get concerned. But then I began to hear leaves crunching. I looked towards the sound and out came Drew, but his face was ghostly pale. He simply told me to follow him. What's going on, man? I asked, but he kept insisting without an answer. I got up to follow him into the woods as he asked. We walked what I can assume about 40 yards when I got a waft of something foil, something repugnant. It got stronger and stronger the farther we walked. The smell grew so bad that when something fell on my shoulder, I breathed in a smell of it, and the reek of death made my stomach churn. I bent over and vomited, causing whatever fell on me to fall on the forest floor. I pulled out my light and pointed it at the ground. I was dumbfounded. There was blood dripping on me from above. Shaking and hesitant, I slowly panned my flashlight up. There were parts of animal hanging above us all over the place. Organs, limbs... Pieces of everything and anything placed in the trees. There was a squirrel hung on the branch, impaled by one of the wooden outcrops. I looked at Drew, still drained of all color. Together, we bolted back to camp. I grabbed my rifle, gathered some things. Then we stopped in the middle of the campsite and looked at each other. Confused, terrified. What were we going to do in a situation like this? We sat down to collect ourselves for a few seconds. We began to shove our food and things back into the trail packs. And as we did, we began to hear crunching a few yards away from us. I pulled out my mag light and pointed it towards where we heard the sound. We were about eight yards away from where we heard it. I flicked on the flashlight. There wasn't anything there. With some relief, we lowered our guns. But, not a second later, a grotesque and elongated hand came from around a tree in front of us. We didn't wait. We sprinted down the hill, phasing in and out of running or jogging, doing the absolute most at any given moment that our bodies would allow. My lungs were burning, legs were stinging, but I kept running. I would glance back and check on Drew and how close he was behind me. I turned off my flashlight, so did Drew, and we laid up against a tree as still as possible. I could see Drew's icy breaths in the moonlight, my eyes finally adjusted to the dark. I saw it, an arm long and bony covered in blood, long fingers with unkempt nails that were curved, it was grabbing on to Drew's shoulder, and Drew had begun screaming. 
The moment I reacted, the arm began to drag him across the forest floor. I sat there frozen, unable to do more than just flinch as I watched. He kept screaming until it all stopped. His screaming stopped. The sounds of my friend struggling stopped. It was all just silence again. I picked myself up and ran, but I tripped over something, falling downhill for a bit before slamming against a tree. I stopped. My back was hurting and I had twisted my ankle before the fall. It was quiet again. There were no crickets, nothing but silence. My eyes already adjusted to the dark, so I could see through the woods kind of well. So I laid as still as possible and observed. Before long, I heard leaves shuffling, and I saw that thing moving through the woods. It was strange and jagged and tense. It moved in a way that was so unnatural, like every millimeter of movement was indescribable in pain to the creature. It was just wrong, but it was long and thin, bones rubbing up against its skin from the inside, as if it was malnourished. I couldn't make out everything at first, but as it got closer, it put its face to the ground and began to sniff the forest floor, sniffing for me. I got a good look at its face then, its features. It was scary. Its chin was elongated and had small, beady eyes. There were dark circles of skin around them, and the skin was darkish gray. Its mouth was large and it spread all the way across its face. It had its teeth bared all dragon and broken looking. Its eyes were bright yellow, and they looked like they glowed. Its mouth and nose, or what was a nose, I think, was covered in a red fluid. It trailed down and covered its torso. I was ten yards away from it then. It sniffed a bit, turned to me, and began to crawl on all fours towards me. I smelled it then. It smelled of roadkill. I vomited in my mouth, but I swallowed it back down, too scared to move. I prayed that it hadn't actually found me yet. I knew I had to keep absolutely still. I laid there for God knows how long as it crawled about, searching for me. I couldn't take it much longer. I stood up slowly, grabbing my bag. I turned and slung it into the woods. Then... The moment it hit the ground, I ran for it. I ran for the parking lot as quickly as I could. I could hear the shrill and deep screech of that thing as it realized that the bag was not its target. But I kept running. I didn't recognize anything at first until I ran into a sign that said National Forest. I heard the same screech but kept going until I made it to the truck. I flung the door open, jumped inside, and started it. I peeled out when I hit the gas, slinging gravel all over the parking lot. As I sped away, I looked back and saw it there, standing in the parking lot light, now shown in detail, standing around nine feet tall. Eyes full of hatred, or was it hunger? I looked forward and put the pedal to the floor, I tore off down the side road and onto the highway. When I was able to sigh with relief, I looked in the mirror. My clothes were shredded and ripped. I was covered in dirt and a bit of blood. I scratched my head, then floored it to the next police station. It took them a while to get me to calm down enough to not scream. I managed to get some game wardens and police officers together the next day. They scaled the mountain, looking for Drew. But I never saw him again. A long time after that, my grandfather came down and talked to me. He explained a few things for me. Told me that people had been going missing and getting kidnapped there since the 1800s and that he's seen the thing that's been doing it himself. It's been eight years since I last saw Drew. Not a day goes by that I don't think of him. He was my best friend. 
take my story as a warning. If you ever go camping, always take a weapon to protect yourself. And for God's sake, do not underestimate the stories you've heard about things that happen out there. Or it might happen. The Beast to of you. Crystal Creek from Harry K. This happened August 2nd of 2019. I've no idea what we encountered, and I'm sharing with you not only to warn you, but also to get some information about what we might have seen. Feel free to judge for yourself. It was the morning of August 2nd. For two days now, my significant other and I, who I'll refer to as S.O., had been camping far inland from Mueller State Park, a fair bit from Green Mountain Falls, right on the edge of Crystal Creek, located in central Colorado. It was a remote location which needed a good hike to get to. We had our tent set up at the edge of a circular clearing in the woods, which had about a 10 meter diameter, with trees enclosing all sides except for a small break where a path was. As I got out of the tent, my SO was sitting just outside, taking in the morning air, Immediately, she retched and said that it smelled of blood. I took a big whiff too. It was heavy ozone and overpoweringly coppery, probably prefix to a storm, I said. We thought nothing of it after that and began preparing our tent ration breakfast. Six hours later in the afternoon, we decided we wanted to make a proper fire. Making sure our tent was sealed up, we opted to forage in the woods for appropriate kindling and decently sized stones to reflect the heat. We were only about 45 meters from camp when odd things began to happen. At this point, the coppery smell was completely faded, and so when it came back so suddenly, we noticed it right away. The air grew heavy as the smell became overpowering, me and my SO both tried to cover our noses with our shirts, but it really didn't help. We continued collecting for the fire, fighting through the urge to gag on the smell. A few minutes later, we heard something. Maybe 10 meters away from us, there was rushing, like an animal moving quickly, and also this weird noise. It sounded like someone or something jittering their voice while mid-laugh. If you want a reference to search, try Peter Griffin's laugh, only in monotone. It was much deeper too, almost distorted, like it was coming from strained vocal cords. The animal was fast, and it seemed to be darting around in the undergrowth right beyond our eyesight. From the way the brush moved and the sound, it seemed large too. My SO was terrified, and so was I afraid of a potentially dangerous and weird-sounding animal. We began to walk quickly back to the camp, preparing to drop our stones and wood to run if necessary. The noise seemed to always stay close by, but never close enough to see what was making it. As we got into the clearing, it seemed to stop altogether. We were both shaken up by this, but we assumed it to be an animal we didn't have much experience with. We didn't lose much of our material on the rush back, so we began assembling a small fire pit. The rest of the afternoon was uneventful, and when night came, we headed inside before it got too dark. A while after we fell asleep, maybe around two in the morning, my SO got up, and I woke up as well. I heard her crawling outside. Then she started yelling at me. Babe, come here. What are you doing? This chilled me to the bone, as I was obviously right behind her in the tent. I turned my phone's flashlight on and called her name. She turned around, and when she saw me, her face went white. What? How are you inside? You just called me from outside the tent. She grew even more pale and started shaking. I knew she was terrified. I quickly rose and pulled her inside the tent. What are you talking about? I've been inside the whole time. No one's out there. She looked petrified. Then she said, Harry, you're out there. I was beyond horrified. 
She was completely convinced that someone who sounded exactly like me was calling to her from the woods. Despite being afraid, I knew I had to appear confident, so I didn't heighten my partner's now extreme anxiety. I grabbed a flashlight and small hunting knife from my backpack. I really am not skilled with weapons, but I thought it might be intimidating enough to ward off whatever was out there, especially if it's just some people trying to scare us for fun. I calmed her down, telling her everything would be okay and that I would go to check. I left the tent, flashlight and knife in hand. I still regret not just staying in there and sleeping the night away. When I exited into the clearing, I did a quick scan with my flashlight. I didn't see anything at first, but then, looking down, I noticed something odd. All the stones around the fire pit were moved, thrown about the camp clearing in seemingly random order. When I noticed this, I bent down to pick up one of the stones. It was extremely hot to the touch, despite the fire being out for a few hours. As I kneeled, examining the stone, the copper smell suddenly filled my nostrils again, far stronger than any time previous. Then, I heard a voice coming from right in front of me, just in the darkness, opposite the direction of the tent. In my exact voice and tone and inflection, it spoke the words I said to my SO seconds before. Don't worry, honey. Everything is fine. A sudden cold came over me, the type of cold that washes over you when you knew you really messed up. Without thinking, I raised my flashlight up. There stood the most horrific thing I'd ever encountered. It was huge. I'm about five foot ten, and this thing had at least two feet on me. It was an extremely decayed, tortured-looking elk, but its body was long as if it had been stretched. Parts of its skin were falling off or missing, and it had a distinctive servine skull formation. Its body was draped in a loose brown, dirty tarp, and it was horribly skinny, with skin and flesh missing around the ribs completely. I didn't dare examine it more. I began to winch backwards, breathless, nearly paralyzed, and then the beast suddenly emitted a blood-curdling, high-pitched scream and just runs off out of the clearing. I heard leaves and branches break for a good few minutes before it finally left earshot. Only then did I return to the tent, trembling, trying to calm myself. My SO was on the verge of breaking down, and so naturally I didn't tell her the truth. I told her that I just saw a deer, and that we surprised each other, causing the thing to scream. I reiterated that there was nothing outside to be afraid of, and we both went to sleep, or tried to anyway. I'm pretty sure both of us spent the entire night pretending to rest, all the while terrified of every stray noise we'd heard outside the tent. As soon as daylight struck, we packed up and left, and as we did, I got a good look at the pattern the stones were in. They created a narrow arch that perfectly resembled a crescent moon, bending around where our tent was at its axis. Sufficed to say, I never have been more terrified than that night in the woods. I still have no idea what I encountered, but maybe someone who hears this story will. Whatever it was, I hope it's native Crystal Creek, Colorado. And if you happen to be planning a camping trip down there anytime soon, I'd pick somewhere else if I were you. Good luck, and stay safe. Something Awful on a School Camping Trip From Louie The school I'm in, we go on camping trips four times a year. Two at the beginning and two towards the end. This camping trip was the third one of that year. The crew of 11 people headed out on Tuesday to set up camp. We found a very gorgeous campsite that was near the river. It was peaceful, but ended up far from it. The weirdness happened on the very first night 
when literally everyone woke up from nightmares. That is, 11 people all having nightmares on the same night and waking up from them. It was crazy and obviously creepy. We brushed it off and moved on with the day. As we were getting ready for the day, I kept seeing glimpses of people out of the corner of my eyes. I thought I was just seeing things. We went through the day and got back to camp at around 6 p.m. We had dinner, then everyone settled into their own worlds. I ended up going to bed around 9. But I woke up at 1.34 a.m. At first I thought I had to go to the bathroom, but then I heard them. It was three of my friends that had recently passed in the last two years. Their deaths were very hard on me, and hearing their voices out of nowhere scared and tormented me. I curled up into a ball and cried while they kept saying, Louie, come here. Come with us, Louie. This went on for what felt like hours, until I finally worked up the courage to wake my best friend up. He was sleeping in the same tent as me. He knows me very well and can help calm me down no matter what. I woke him, crying my heart out to him. He got up, talked to me, kept me company until I calmed down. But after that, I had the urgent need to go to the bathroom. But of course, I was far too scared to go by myself. My friend got up with me and we went over to the outhouse. After I did my business, I walked out to see my friend staring up at the sky. I asked what he was looking at, and he pointed up at the moon. I looked up, and as soon as I did, I felt this wave of nausea hit. I threw up my dinner immediately, but that snapped my friend out of his trance of the moon. After I was done, we jogged back to the tent, and we remained there until I fell asleep. I have no clue what was in those woods, but it was dark, and I think it was evil. My friend has told me that ever since that trip, he has had trouble sleeping. He sees and hears things at night. We have no idea what's happening, but whatever was out there that night, it probably came home with us. Backyard Camping from Michael 131. I don't remember how old I was. I believe I was seven years old. We had just moved in next door to my neighbor, whom we've known for about 15 years and was basically family. It was the 4th of July. I just got back from Wyoming. We had asked our neighbor if we could gather a bunch of our friends and camp in her backyard. She said yes so we set up some tents and watched the fireworks before heading to our tents for the night. Sometime during the night, my sister had gotten up to go to the bathroom. She soon came back, seemingly uneventful. Later that evening, we heard huffing noises outside the tent. Mind you, bears around our parts in a rural village in Ohio, we don't have a dense enough forest to house bears. Usually, it's just coyotes and deer and smaller predators but it was a full moon, so we could see pretty well. Just outside the tents, it was a well-lit field. Keep this in mind, the footsteps and huffing noises kept circling the tents, and everyone heard it. As it approached my tent, I made out the unmistakable figure of a bear, seemingly searching for food or other scavengeable products. All of us were unarmed, as the massive creature began to paw and bite at the tent, easily creating ribbons out of the tent nylon. I'm not sure if it knew I was inside the tent, but it definitely wanted inside. Suddenly, one of my friends screamed, and the thing bounded away before it could get all the way in. This was terrifying. Imagine growing up in an area where bears don't exist, only to wake up in the middle of the night in a tent as one begins to chew through the wall. I'm so glad it was able to be scared away. Apparently, it wasn't that hungry. If you're wondering where the bear came from, it was apparently an escaped bear from a local zoo, and it just happened to come our way. 
The Little Girl from Burgherder. I was visiting some of my girlfriend's friends in her hometown of Rock Creek, British Columbia, Canada. It's one of those kinds of towns that has a gas station, a restaurant and a bar, and a couple of local shops. Very little there. Her family owns an acreage there consisting of a long driveway, a kinda run-down house, a shop, and a small animal enclosure with barns. It was summer and gets very warm that time of year in the area, so we decided to set up a tent on the deck of the shop and sleep outside. The shop is two stories, so the deck is fairly high up. We spent the day with her friend. It was getting late, so we decided to go set up our makeshift camp. Her friend said she may come by at some point and hang out later, so off we went back to the property. When we got there, it was a bit windy, but it was a clear summer night. We set up a propane fire pit and just hung out for a bit. It got dark and we were tired from traveling that day, so we went to bed, figuring her friend decided not to come. This is when things got weird. Not more than 10 minutes after being in bed, we heard a girl laughing in the distance. It was close enough it sounded like it was from the driveway area. We assumed her friend came up after all, so we crawled out of our tents and set up the chairs again. We waited, and no one came around. We chalked it up to the wind. We get back into bed, and not more than ten minutes goes by before we hear it again. This girl laughing sounded closer this time. By now, we were creeped out, so we didn't want to investigate. I know most people want the juicy tale of some grotesque sight, but screw that, I was not going out there. After the second time, we didn't hear it again, and we eventually fell asleep, still blaming the wind. The following day, we mentioned the story to her dad. He told us a tale about some years back before he bought the farm in the 70s. There was a family that lived there, a man, his wife, and daughter. The daughter was apparently killed in a farming accident. She was backed over by a tractor. I've been to the property since, but I'll never go back at night. After hearing that story, I'm glad I stayed in the tent. It circled my tent all night. From James is Cole. Location unknown. It was the early 1980s, and my dad and uncle both bought a summer home in the countryside, which had some beautiful, dense woods behind it. We would often go there over the summer and enjoy the serenity of nature away from the city. At that time, my cousin and I would hang out a lot together, and we spent many hours hiking deep into those woods behind the house. And being independent kids, we decided to take my dad's camping equipment and set up an overnight campsite about 100 feet away from the house. We did this every day, and it became the thing we did every summer. Our parents were always nearby in the house, and always kept their windows open where they could easily see and hear us. They were totally okay with us being alone in the woods at night, and sometimes even pushed us to spend more time out there, even when we didn't feel like it. It became our favorite getaway from the city, and each summer, we really looked forward to going. It was one particular summer. We weren't going to go because my uncle had to go out of state, but I had been waiting all year to go, and I was devastated after hearing that we wouldn't be going after all. It meant that I'd have to go to day camp with all those annoying kids from school, and they didn't treat me too kindly. Being a five-hour drive north, my parents weren't going to make such a trip without my uncle and his family, so the answer was no and no. I never was a nagging child and often tried to help out when I could, but that summer, oh, you bet I acted up. I made the summer pretty difficult whenever I could and always mentioned to them how they could make it better for me. I didn't want to wait another whole year and I tried my best to convince them with whatever tactic I thought would work. To my surprise, my constant nagging seemed to have worked on them. 
because one day they finally gave in. I later realized that it was probably because a family friend decided to come along with us and make the trip worth our while. Anyway, we traveled together for five straight hours and finally reached our destination. I could smell that pine wood scent again and I got ready to build my campsite. It took a little longer than usual because I was alone, but I got it all set up nice and dandy. I'd gone camping enough times before with my cousin, and I felt more than confident to be alone in the dark. Although, I did decide to set up my tent a bit closer to the house, just in case. The sun began to set, and I glanced at my watch. It was 8.35 p.m., there was this unusual quietness that made me a bit anxious. But I was usually chatting with my cousin and just thought I never noticed it, not until now. Part of our camping experience was reading science fiction novels until we got tired and fell asleep. And for that night, I brought an exciting new book I'd wanted to read for some time. Flashlight in one hand and book in the other, I began to read... This flashlight was one of those heavy metal ones that often flickered out. I'd have to hit it a couple of times and that would usually do the trick. It must have been around 4 a.m. when I was suddenly awakened by the sound of something brushing against my tent. At first, I wasn't sure if I had just imagined it or not, or if it was some rabbit that had passed by, but I quietly sat up for a moment and listened to my surroundings. There were no sounds and nothing special to hear, so I assumed it was just a small animal, and I tried to fall back to sleep. A few minutes passed by, and I was about to doze off, when something about 40 feet away from me made this freakishly angry feline growl that turned into what sounded like a woman with an old, hoarse voice. A cold shiver suddenly ran down my spine, and my thoughts began to race through my head as I imagined what it could be. It sounded human, but it also sounded like an animal. I thought of yelling for my mom and dad, but I was way too scared to even make a sound. I reached for my flashlight, and I turned it on, but instantly I realized the mistake I had made as the growl suddenly became quiet. I quickly shut off the light, and I hid under my sleeping bag, hoping that it did not hear me or that it had not seen my light. To my horror, it slowly approached and stopped right outside my tent. For a while, it just stood there, breathing loudly, and each breath sounded raspy and was full of moist pops and clicks like its throat was filled with far too much saliva. I thought maybe it would go away if I just waited, but several more minutes passed and the thing did not move. I could hear its head moving back and forth like it was trying to find me or sense where I was, but I didn't dare let out a breath or move a muscle. Every so often it would scratch the wall of the tent like it was testing the walls, thinking about coming inside. But I prayed and prayed that it didn't. I waited, every single minute feeling like an entire hour. It kept circling me, walking and rubbing itself against the tent all night, trying to find a way to get into me, but it luckily never did. It wasn't until dawn broke, when the sun started to come up, that I finally heard it scurry away, and I no longer heard it. When my parents found me, they said that I was white like snow and they couldn't move. I was in such a state of shock that they rushed me to the hospital right away, and I stayed there for a couple of days. I only recovered a few months later, but I still get chills every time I share this story with people. I never went camping for many years after that, but I eventually did start camping again with a few buddies of mine over the years. 
I never did go back in the woods alone. My dad eventually sold the house to some couple who lives there to this very day, and I never experienced anything like it since. What it could have been, I can't tell you. Maybe it was just some crazy old woman, or maybe it really was a monster. It watched me from the dark. From Bananaconda. Location unknown. I was 18 years old, camping with a couple of my friends. It was snowy, and biting cold winds battered our flimsy tents. We all sat outside on log benches, surrounding a campfire. The fire snapped and popped as the sun dipped below the black trees, and when the light was gone, we all fell silent, staring at the fire. For about 30 minutes, we sat there in silence until the friend next to me sat up and declared that he was going off to bed. After that, the rest of us decided that there would be no more talk or stories that night, and we also slowly receded into our tents. Later on, we were all awakened by a loud and piercing scream. I stepped outside the tent to investigate and was shortly joined by the others. The younger friends began discussing what may have made that sound and were quickly hushed by the others. One of my friends went to grab a flashlight. He brought it out and pointed it into the forest but did not turn it on. Instead, he shivered a bit, then handed it to me. You turned it on, he said. I took it from him and flicked it on. The beam shone through the trees, and a pair of eyes shone back. Everyone gasped. The eyes were about 30 yards in front of us, larger than a man's, and solid white. They reflected the flashlight beam perfectly well. They seemed to swell with excitement. I couldn't see any other part of the creature. We all stood there watching it, and it watched us. This continued for a while, us staring at it as it blinked only occasionally, as if to show us that yes, this was in fact some creature watching us. After about an hour, I was as tired as I was scared. I set up the flashlight, pointing at the eye still, then went back into my tent with the flap still open so that I could watch the eyes. I didn't plan to sleep, though I was soon out cold. I woke up some time after. It was still dark. I peered outside the tent flap and I saw that the eyes were gone. I closed the flap, shivered with relief, and I went to sleep. The next morning, we woke up to find footprints in the snow that we didn't recognize. They circled our tents a number of times. This unnerved me to my core. I asked them if they had been up walking around that night, and they all said no. We left quickly after that, and never figured out what we saw. A Near Encounter with a Wendigo from Leprechaun. Location unknown. This took place on a camping trip on September 7th of 2018. I wasn't originally planning on going camping. I just wanted to kick back for the day. But two of my close friends, Jack and Chase, came over with camping gear because they said that day looked quite nice to be out. I was slightly against it at first, as I had an eerie encounter a few years back, but they pressed me on it, and I soon gave in. It took me a while to get ready, but soon we were on our way to the nearby woods. By the time we got to the spot we were going to, it was basically night, 
so we rushed to set up the tents and start a fire before it got extremely dark. Eventually, we managed to get a decent fire going, and for most of the night, things were going as per usual. It was quiet and chill. That is, until the sun was completely gone from the horizon. When it was pitch black, the rain came down hard, and we were forced to retreat into our tents. Chase and I shared a smaller tent, while Jack got his own larger one. The three of us were discussing how we could pass the time. We weren't tired yet, and by 3 a.m. we were still up. And that's around the time things went even further south. We heard Jack from the other tent suddenly hush us. When it went quiet, we heard footsteps around us, and we all went silent after that. Chase looked as worried as I did, and me being skeptical about these things. I was thinking of all the possible things it could be. Some trespasser on our campsite, a hiker that stumbled upon our camp, some kid playing a prank. I then decided to quietly look outside, so I pulled the tent zipper to the side, and slowly and cautiously, I peeped out. But as soon as I did, my heart froze. Standing in the middle of our campsite, was a white figure. They weren't wearing any clothes, and they were thin and frail. They appeared to be looking around our campsite rather curiously. Chase must have been watching my face and saw the horrid look on it because he began to freak out. I looked over and silently placed a finger over my lips to quiet him. We stayed there, silent for about an hour, before we decided to slowly creep out to look around. The only form of protection we had at the time was a karambit my friend brought, and my leathermen. It really wasn't much, and I was hoping we didn't need to use them. When we stepped out into the campsite, we saw nothing. We walked around but never saw the thing that I'd seen through the flap. We crowded around the fire and restarted it, I was worried, but eventually I calmed down. After staying up for a little while, a sense of safety returned to us, and we felt ready to crawl back into our tents for some rest. But just as Jack was crawling into his tent flap, Chase grabbed me from behind by my shoulder, and he pointed into the woods. I followed his finger, and when my eyes adjusted, my mouth hung open. It was standing now, right in the woods, back facing us. It was so motionless. I felt frozen in place, not wanting to alarm it, but when we heard the sound coming from it, we almost screamed, Please help me. The words came out in a slow, forced manner. The creature itself was tall and lanky, and its limbs were long, almost exaggerated. As we stared at it, it suddenly fell to all fours and ran, disappearing into the woods. Its movement was more like an insect than a person. As soon as we had the courage to move again, we all hid in the same tent, scared and wide awake. None of the three of us spoke a word until sunrise. When it was light out, we packed up as quickly as possible and got out of Dodge, but the whole trip home I felt like we were being watched, followed. The expression on the other guys' faces, I'll never forget it. I've never seen them so afraid. It's no wonder they refused to speak of it after we made it back home. I don't think any of us will forget this experience. It's Sinister, from William C. Location, an area called East Fork in an unspecified state. In my life, I've had two experiences that solidify my belief in creatures that are beyond our understanding. I'll share one of these experiences with you. It was my first encounter I was 17, 
I was going on a horseback riding trip with my father and his friends. We were riding the trails of a hilly area called East Fork. Thick woods and tall cliffs made for beautiful scenery during the ride, broken only by the occasional camp area or stable for riders to rest their horses for the night. We spent all day riding, starting around 10 that morning, on until around 7 that evening. We met other riders and even had lunch with one group whose path we crossed on several occasions throughout the trails. During the ride, my dad and I got into an argument about me being on my phone while we rode. Afterwards, he would complain about it to his friends frequently during the rest of the ride. After we finally stopped to make camp, I confronted him about keeping on about it all day. After heated words were thrown by each of us, I finally yelled at him about being stubborn and I stomped off through the woods. I wandered around for about 30 minutes, cooling off, when I ran across another campsite. This happened to be the group we had shared lunch with that afternoon. The group had been a family of six, one woman, two men, and one teenage girl and two younger kids, a boy and a girl. One of the men, named Tom, greeted me cheerfully when he saw me and asked where the rest of my troop was. I told him I was just taking a walk to get some time away from my dad. He chuckled, then asked if I wanted to join them for dinner, saying he would walk me back to my father's camp afterwards. Smelling the food, my stomach rumbled, sealing our agreement. I sat down around the fire they had, and I was introduced to his family, whom I had only met briefly earlier that day. The other man was Tom's brother Keith, the woman, Tom's wife Kathleen, and their three kids, Jordan, Molly, and Brian, the latter two being twins. After the names were all said and remembered, I chatted with Jordan and Tom while Kathleen set out plates on the card table that they were using for dinner preparations. Keith called over saying dinner was ready, and we all ate, laughed, and talked for a while. As we were finishing up, Keith excused himself to use the restroom behind the camper that they had set up next to their campsite. Jordan and I continued to chat, while Tom strummed on an old guitar that he had pulled out once we had finished eating. Kathleen had gone to tuck the twins into bed inside the camper. Around then, Tom offered to walk me back to my camp. It was getting late, so I agreed, and we both stood. Suddenly, Jordan froze in between us. We looked at her as she turned pale, and a look of silent terror crossed her face as she stared behind us towards the end of the camper. Tom and I both turned and looked to see a tall, lean, and nightmarish creature. It was at least nine feet tall, not including the antlers on its head. Its body was extremely muscular and lanky at the same time. Its head was barely similar to a deer's skull, with only bits of skin still hanging in places. Its arms were clawed, one of which was holding on to a fresh bit of meat. Tom audibly cursed, and Jordan screamed. I was frozen with fear, staring at something that did not make sense to me, something that just shouldn't exist. Hearing the commotion, hearing the commotion, Kathleen came out of the camper, a Remington in her hands. One look at the thing in front of her family, her eyes grew wide and her mouth slunk open. She fired, though I am not sure she was even trying to though she hit it. The creature screamed and then ran off into the woods, pounding the soil underneath it, all the while releasing this hellish shriek. It was the worst sound I'd ever heard. After it ran off, Tom ordered everyone into the camper and started calling out for his brother, but Keith did not answer. 
he grabbed a flashlight and handed me one, asking me, no, begging me to help him look, but to stay close to the camper. We didn't have to look very far. We found what remained of Keith about 10 feet into the woods behind the camper, his pants still undone from relieving himself. There were bites taken out of his face and stomach, and his arm was gone, which I later realized was what the creature had been holding in its claw. Kathleen had called the park rangers while we had gone out to look, and maybe 20 minutes later they showed up with two police officers. We were all thoroughly questioned, and the remains were looked at. After the cops finished talking to me, they called my dad and informed him of where I was and why they had been calling. While they spoke to him on the phone, I heard him say that I had been witness to a bear attack. I was stunned. That wasn't a bear. I never even spoke of a bear in my statement. Did they even look at the remains? In no way whatsoever did this attack resemble a bear. After a while, my dad came and picked me up, asking me if I was okay. I nodded, then bid goodbye to the traumatized family, who had been so kind to me earlier, yet now looked lost and confused, a feeling that I understood completely. Strange Creature in the Woods From Thetapon Location Texas and Oklahoma. I've been hunting all my life, and I've never been afraid of the woods. And I've never believed in Bigfoot, shapeshifters, or goatmen, or anything like that. But in May 2012, I went snake hunting, camping, in eastern Texas and Oklahoma. I had been warned that bears were causing trouble at campsites and that I should stay at only marked campsites. But I'm not one to do as I'm told, for better or for worse. So I took my German Shepherd and Odd Six. After a hard day of hunting for dens, I was tired and wanted to go to sleep. It was 4.45 a.m. when my dog started barking, waking me up and wanting to be out of the tent. No matter how many times I told him to be quiet, he wouldn't let it go. Finally, I grew tired of his barking and let him out. He took off to the edge of the clearing and stopped. I then knew by the way he was acting that he was after something. I grabbed my odd six and went toward the dog. I hadn't gotten more than 25 yards when the dog crawled out of the woods. He was limping bad, and only a few seconds later... I saw something coming after it, a large black creature standing on hind feet. I yelled for whoever it was that I was armed and that they'd better show themselves. Receiving no answer, I fired with a warning, but the thing didn't budge. I backed up and I looked toward my dog. He needed to get to a vet fast. He was hurt pretty bad. I picked him up and I ran toward my truck. I managed to make it inside, and I went back to town. I called the local sheriff as well, but he told me to call the game warden right away. I said that I was going to the vet, and I was told that he would meet me there. The vet said that they would need to keep the dog for about a week, and when the game warden arrived, he began asking about the creature that I saw. We ended up taking his truck back to the campsite, which was now all torn to shreds, and the ice chest had been turned over and emptied. The poles from the tent had been tossed in a nearby tree. I showed him the spot in the woods where I saw it. There we found a very obvious trail of fluids and fur. We followed it for a mile or two, which again was strangely easy. The creature didn't even attempt to hide its path. But suddenly the trail just stopped, as if the creature disappeared. I was confused, but the warden was terrified. He said that we needed now, and that he had the feeling that if we went any further, we'd be walking into a trap. 
I decided to listen to his rather ominous advice. We went back to his truck and drove back to town. I don't really know what the thing was that I saw. I've been back to that area twice, and now my dog is too afraid to go out of the tent. Those words spoken by the warden haunt me to this day, because what sort of animal is out there setting up traps for people, one that scared even the game warden, when both of us were armed? <laughs>